Are you bored with where you work? There's no shame in it. A lot of people are. Or maybe you hit a run of bad luck recently, and you got furloughed or let go from your old job. It's a stressful time, and you're probably asking, what type of career would be right for me? Maybe you want some excitement, like chasing down escaped monsters from high-security containment facilities. Maybe you want something a little more intellectually engaging, like joining some of the world's finest minds in finding the answers to mysterious ancient secrets. Or maybe you're the ambitious type, someone with plenty of hashtag hustle. Perhaps nothing would satisfy you more than climbing to the very top of the corporate ladder, into a position that would make you one of the most powerful human beings on the planet. If any or even all of these sound like they describe you, then maybe your perfect career would be working for the SCP Foundation, an incredibly powerful top-secret organization devoted to securing, containing, and protecting the supernatural across the globe and beyond. You could be one of the thousands of little turning cogs that keeps this organization running and keeping the world safe from supernatural threats. But you can't even get into your local country club. How can you find your way into one of the most elite groups in history? Well, we can't pretend it'll be easy, but it's definitely not impossible. Today, we're going to give you a primer on the potential ways you could join the proud ranks of the SCP Foundation. With help from files and evidence across the Foundation database, we've figured out many of the different positions available at the SCP Foundation, and what actions and qualifications you may need to make the cut. Though we can't promise you won't be terminated, vaporized, eaten, or sent to a terrifying pocket dimension in the process. First, it's vital to know exactly what you're applying for. The SCP Foundation is a complex group, but thankfully for us, it does have a command structure that's pretty easy to understand. This will help us figure out the positions on offer, so you can update your LinkedIn profile accordingly. There are two main categories of jobs at play here. We have security clearance categories, which range from 0 to 5, and we have personnel classifications, which run from A-class to E-class. Let us break it down for you. Level 0 security clearance covers jobs like logistics and janitorial services. They're the lowest entry level of any foundation jobs, and you'll basically be told nothing. You might as well be cleaning the bathrooms at a local gym. Level 1 covers most of the same jobs as level 0, except that these staff members perform their jobs in closer proximity to anomalies. So you'll still be cleaning bathrooms, but at greater risk to your life. Level 2 is the most common level of clearance, and covers most of the jobs you can apply for at the Foundation. Junior researchers, field operatives, containment specialists. You have a decent grasp on the strangeness of your profession, but you're still locked out of the major secrets. Level 3 is a step up and covers most of the senior research staff, project managers, security officers, response team members, and mobile task force operatives, all of which we'll discuss more later. Level 4 is top secret and reserved for only senior administrative positions, like site directors, security directors, or mobile task force commanders. Finally, level 5, which gives access to every secret the Foundation holds and more. This is reserved largely for the O5 Council and those working directly under them. We're not saying it's necessarily impossible for you to get into one of those 13 seats of ultimate power, but it's probably impossible. The A through E personnel class are a little easier to process. The further along your letter is in the alphabet, the more dangerous your job, because you work in closer proximity to anomalies. A class staff are considered critical to the running of the Foundation, like the O5 Council, so they're usually not even allowed near an anomaly. D class, as you probably already know, are guinea pigs regularly thrown into the clutches of anomalies to see what happens. The only thing worse is E class which applies to agents who are already under the active effects of anomalies, and thus, are quarantined. Now that you fully understand the command structure of the SCP Foundation, we can talk about specific roles, and what it may take to find these various job titles attached to your name. We'll start with the lowest of the low, and work our way up to the top of the pyramid, starting, of course, with D-Class. The upside of D-Class is that you don't really need any kind of qualifications to join, the majority of D-Class personnel are death row inmates, so if you commit a few capital offenses and get yourself caught, you'll likely be up for consideration. After all, employee turnaround for D-Class is pretty crazy, for obvious reasons. The downside is that you really, really, really don't want to become a D-Class. While there are some rare examples of the lives of D-Classes being improved, 
like the one who was released to pursue a law degree after being educated by SCP-5094. It's largely a literally dead-end job. But let's say you're a little luckier than that, and the job you seek, while still dangerous, will at least get you a decent pension and dental coverage. We're talking about the day-to-day bread-and-butter jobs that keep the whole foundation running. Site Staff If you're working on site at any of the hundreds or even thousands of secure areas the Foundation maintains across the globe, you have four different possible career paths. Containment Specialist, Researcher, Security Officer, and Tactical Response Officer. Containment Specialists are, as you can probably tell from the name, experts in maintaining containment for anomalies. This career path forks into two possible branches. In the more active of the two branches, containment specialists enter zones of active anomalous activity and contain the anomaly for transport back to the nearest operational site. To join this career path, you'd likely be expected to come from a military background due to the risky and tactical nature of the job. The second branch is a little less hands-on. These are the actual engineers and technicians who work with researchers to devise the containment procedures for the various SCPs. For this role, you'll not only need to likely understand physics and engineering at an expert level, you'll also need an extraordinarily creative mind. You'll need to think outside of the box to keep the anomalies in the box. A recurring theme you'll find when it comes to Foundation jobs is that you don't seek out the Foundation for a job. If you're the right person and show potential, they'll find you. Researchers are a similar story. These are the best research scientists in the world, scouted by the Foundation to assist the cause. If you're someone with a true passion for science, with topics including but not limited to biology, physics, chemistry, botany, and xenobiology, and you're willing to put in the work to reach the very top of your field, the Foundation may just come knocking at your door. Much like a lot of prestigious universities, the Foundation also sometimes considers legacy candidates. The famous Dr. Bright, for example, became a member of the Foundation's research corps because his mother and father worked for the Foundation, and it didn't hurt that several of his siblings were anomalous too. Next, security officers, more informally known as guards. This job is worth applying for the paycheck alone, as there's likely some good hazard pay attached to it. Most security officers perform physical guard duties and are recruited from law enforcement, the corrections industry, and the military. However, the other half of the security officers work in information security and, as a result, are chosen for their IT prowess and their background in the intelligence community. And finally, as far as site staff are concerned, we have tactical response officers. Don't expect to get this job if your background is civilian, though since these special operatives are the first line of defense between Foundation sites and external threats, from anomalous attackers to hostile groups of interest trying to infiltrate. If you want this job, you'll really need to put in the hours, days, months, and years rising through the ranks in the military. If you do get the job, though, you'll likely be stationed at one of the larger and more important sites to remain on constant guard for any potential threats. But let's say you don't want to work on a containment site. Maybe you want to travel, see the world, get a little excitement. Thankfully, there are two different career paths that allow you to do just that. Field agents and the mobile task force members. The field agent position is one of the more accessible in the Foundation, largely because of the fact that there are so many ways in. If you're an exceptionally observant and discreet person, this job is probably for you seeing as it's essentially being a spy for the Foundation. You may be offered the job if you work in law enforcement, the government, or any kind of emergency service. These undercover agents also infiltrate groups of interest or secret societies the Foundation wishes to keep an eye on, like the Serpent's Hand or the Children of the Scarlet King. If you're in any of these positions or already work as a field agent for the mainstream intelligence community, becoming a Foundation field agent may just be your calling. Mobile task forces are a little more extreme. They're made up of elite operatives drawn from all over the Foundation, often with a heavy emphasis on military experience. The more specialized you are, the more likely you are to land a spot on one of these teams. Are you an expert in explosives? Try for MTF Epsilon 9, the Fire Eaters. Are you an expert in epidemiology and biohazard containment? Join MTF Beta 7, dubbed the Maz Hatters. Are you a benevolent anomaly aligned with the interests of the Foundation? MTF Alpha 9, aka Last Hope, is just for you. The Foundation sometimes even recruits ex-members of enemy groups of interests into MTFs on occasion. 
Of course, despite there being plenty of ways into this profession, none of them are easy, and the job carries huge risks due to how often MTFs see combat. What if you've always wanted to be more of a leader than a follower, though? You're a natural manager, someone who has all their anomalous ducks in a row. Perhaps you're eyeing the role of site director, the one who all other department heads on site report directly to. How do you get your foot in the door? It's simple. Site directors start off working some other job for the foundation, like researcher or security officer, and simply climb through the ranks until they reach the most senior position in the site where they work. Oftentimes, site directors were previously very committed researchers, like Dr. Bright or Dr. Gears. And finally, the biggest question of all. How does one become a member of the legendary O5 Council? Due to the extremely mysterious nature of the Council, this one is hard to say. Exact information about each member and their past is shrouded in secrecy, but it stands to reason that any new members are elected in by a majority of the pre-existing Council members on the board. Like Dr. Bright's father, Adam Bright, it is theoretically possible to work your butt off and get into the O5 Council through decades of pure grit, but you're probably wasting your time. The Council works in mysterious ways, after all. If we've learned anything today, it's that any job actually worth having at the SCP Foundation isn't gotten easily. But hey, considering the SCP Foundation has its shadowy fingers in every pie, and its thousands of factions worldwide are masked by just as many public-facing front businesses, for all you know, you might be working for the Foundation already. The SCP Foundation is the most powerful organization on planet Earth. Thanks to their cooperation with all world governments as well as private organizations, front businesses, and wealthy benefactors, they have truly unlimited funds. Their ranks include the best and brightest humanity has to offer, and even some minds outside the human race. They have access to advanced and anomalous technology, from powerful weapons to memory-wiping amnestics, to state-of-the-art equipment that even Elon Musk could only dream of. And this is a good thing too, since we rely on them to contain thousands of anomalies and stay vigilant for thousands or even millions more. Everything from immortal lizards to supernatural sarkic flesh viruses to bona fide reality warping demigods like the deer, the gate guardian, and the legendary Scarlet King. And who sits at the tip of this mighty pyramid, delegating to everyone below and keeping the wheels turning on this impossibly large behemoth of a group? Of course, it's the O5 Council. A group of 13 humans with so much money and institutional power, they're the closest a non-anomalous figure can come to being a god. Also commonly known as O5 Command, the Overseers, and the Overwatch, people below level 2 clearance at the Foundation have no idea who they are, or if they even actually exist. Those at level 3 and 4 know just enough to be terrified of them, and little else. Between them, they know every single secret kept by a foundation known for utmost confidentiality. They are the hungry spider at the center of this web of monsters, magic, backstabbing, and espionage, noticing even the tiniest of vibrations on their silk strings. Nothing about the O5 Council is simple or straightforward. Of the information out there and available about them, there's really no way to know just how much of it is intentional misinformation put out there to protect their secrets. It's said that they use complex layers of pseudonyms and body doubles. Some say that each number in the council actually represents several different people using the title. Some say there are far fewer members than 13, and these are just a series of smoke screens to avoid detection. Some even say to avoid total capture or assassination, at least one member remains in a space station orbiting the Earth at all times. Today we're going to tell you what we know. Perhaps it's true, perhaps it isn't. But as with all things regarding the O5 Council, it's certain to be fascinating either way. We're going to look at the Council's role in the Foundation, the kind of staff and the mobile task force that works around them, and some of the scattered and often contradictory theories about the identities of each of the 13 members of this exclusive Foundation cabal. We hope you have your level 5 clearance too, or we both might not make it to the end of the video. This is the SCP Foundation's O5 Council. 
Like a lot of secret organizations, the Foundation goes to great lengths to make sure their forbidden knowledge remains secret. That's why low-level junior researchers, guards, and janitorial staff aren't privy to where all the bodies are buried, both literally and metaphorically speaking. The Foundation has five levels of security clearance, and the O5 Council and their select staff are the only ones who are at Security Level 5, also known as Thaumiel Clearance. O5 Council members are also considered Class A Foundation staff, meaning they are of critical value to the operations of the Foundation. As such, they're not permitted to interact with any anomalies for fear of corruption, alteration, or death. Though, of course, seeing as they're the most powerful people on Earth, they don't always follow their own rules on this one. In the event of an emergency, their evacuation and transportation to a designated safe zone becomes a top priority to all Foundation underlings. They rarely, if ever, interact with the majority of the Foundation, instead favoring to use a vast network of messengers and go-betweens for security purposes. Much like the US Supreme Court, being a member of the O5 Council is supposed to be a lifetime appointment, and the death and or replacement of a member of the O5 Council is considered a truly extraordinary event. On occasion, there have been rumors of the O5 members performing power moves and killing their own colleagues to consolidate control. This type of event is thought to have been the ultimate fate of Dr. Jack Bright's father, who supposedly ascended to the position of O5 in hopes of freeing his anomalous daughter from containment. <gasps> Rumor has it that he was assassinated by his fellow council members and replaced for his trouble. While the O5 council aren't meant to interact with any anomalies, this isn't always the case in practice. It's possible that members of the O5 council make regular use of their access to SCP-006, a small well whose water has the ability to cure disease and imbue vitality, health, and longevity in anyone who drinks it. It's believed by some that as a precaution against such potential attacks from powerful reality warpers and CK-class reality restructuring events, each member of O5 carries a small charm made from the flesh of a deceased but immensely strong reality warper. This supposedly creates a pocket of dimensional stability around them wherever they go. While it's believed that all members of O5 Council are fundamentally human, it's possible or even likely that many of them have experienced anomalous alterations during their ascent to ultimate power. They're also said to surround themselves with a number of powerful anomalous individuals for protection. Which leads us nicely to our next point. Who works directly with the notoriously private and inaccessible O5 Council? Let's take a look. First, the O5 Council's muscle. Mobile Task Force Alpha-01, appropriately nicknamed the Red Right Hand. These are the best of the best, handpicked for both skill and absolute loyalty to the Council. They work with an extra layer of secrecy and accept their orders directly from O5. If the O5 Council decides it doesn't care for you, then the red laser dot that appears on your head an hour later is attached to the rifle of a red right hand operative. This is a group with a checkered past though. Many of their members are believed to have splintered from the group to form the Chaos Insurgency, a group in direct opposition to the Foundation. Though if you ever bring this up with an earshot of a member of the O5 Council, your likelihood of going mysteriously missing shortly after is extremely high. But it takes more than just guns to keep the Foundation's mission moving forward. The figure who represents the interests of the O5 Council on the world stage is known simply as the Administrator. This mysterious, eccentric, and likely anomalous figure is the powerful mouthpiece of the Council, and it's a role that's been held by a number of people since the Foundation was first founded. The other staff assigned to the O5 Council are sometimes referred to as the Factorum, and these are some of the only people outside of the O5 Council occasionally afforded Level 5 clearances. These bodyguards and personal assistants are often immensely powerful, both in the sense that they wield a great deal of institutional strength and that they're often powerful anomalies themselves. Don't expect just anyone to get elected to these positions, after all. Only the very best get to work in close proximity to the O5 Council. So this leaves us with the big question. Who exactly are the O5 Council? The short answer is that we don't know for sure, and that the information we do have about the 13 most powerful people in the world is often contradictory and strange. First, we have O5-1, often considered the most powerful of the entire Council. 
Many believe that O5-1 is one of the occult holdovers from the member organizations that first started the Foundation. And if that's true, O5-1 is likely to be at least 200 years old. They've been able to survive to this age thanks to magical or anomalous intervention. The race and gender of O5-1 varies between accounts. O5-2 is considered to be one of the more actively anomalous of the O5 Council members. While accounts split on whether they are male or female, Consistent elements and stories about them paint the picture of an elderly person with clues to a mysterious past, like having crucifixion scars or consistent ties to Dr. Sophia Light, a holdover from an erased timeline. O5-3 is consistently seen as male and largely seen as being of European descent, regardless of the other details shared. He's generally considered to be extremely intelligent, as well as one of the nicer members of the Council acting as a kind of conscience for the others. O5-4 is another figure considered to be most likely male, and the circumstances of their entrance into the Council are generally considered to be rather spectacular. Whether you believe the story that they got in by killing the previous O5-4 during a hostile takeover situation, or that they were the first to collect the entire Little Mister series from Dr. Wondertainment. O5-5 is also most likely male, and some accounts consider him to be one of the more front-facing members of the Council. He's more likely to interact with the public than others, and it's speculated that he's the one who runs the vast network of front businesses regularly used for cover by the Foundation at large. O5-6 is most likely male, and probably of European descent. His reputation is mixed, though. Some speculate that he was formerly the Foundation's top field agent, while others believe he's a puppet of the Global Occult Coalition, one of the Foundation's rival organizations. To some, he's known as the Cowboy. Some believe that O5-7 is a woman of South Asian descent. She's said to be a charismatic master tactician and plays a crucial role in selecting and hiring the elite staff that work around the O5 Council. O5-8 is one of the more mysterious figures, even among the already extremely secretive O5 Council. Some speculate that they may have been assassinated, as they haven't been seen in public for quite some time, though this may just be a ruse to fool would-be backstabbers. O5-9 is another somewhat controversial figure within the Council. Some believe that O5-9 is a woman hired to join the Council directly from the public sector after a scandal. Others believe that O5-9 is merely the informal title for whomever is the acting head of the Foundation Intelligence Agency. O5-10 is widely believed to have vast combat experience of one form or another. Some refer to them as the Assassin, a female former Foundation hitman who's likely the most proficient killer alive. Others call them the Veteran or the Mad General, a former high-level member of the U.S. military. It's speculated by some that O5-11 is a high-level politician placed by the Council on the United States Senate to maintain Foundation control over political questions and dealings. Others believe he's an 80-year-old Japanese bureaucrat with self-esteem issues. Yet another rumor states that this person is actually the Foundation's chief disinformation officer, so maybe both of these rumors are just lies meant to lead us off the track. O5-12 is believed by many to have once been Adam Bright, father of famous Foundation researcher and anomaly Dr. Jack Bright. He worked his way onto the Council to try to free his own daughter, SCP-321, from containment, and was assassinated by his fellow Council members in the process. Or, O5-12 might be the accountant for the Overseer Council, Maybe one day we'll know whether O5-12 is best known for being someone who climbed the ranks of the most powerful organization in the world to save his daughter, or if he really just likes spreadsheets. Whether O5-13 ever actually existed is hotly debated. Many speculate that there were originally only 12 members, and that 13 was added as a tiebreaker in council votes. Others say 13 was only added due to the modern occult significance of the number 13. Some believe there is no 13, and it's merely another attempt to keep everyone on their toes. Or there's a rumor that all of the members of the Council are O5-13, taking turns to act as the tie-breaking 13th vote. Whatever the case is with any of the particular members of the group, the O5 Council is one of the smallest and yet most important groups of people in the SCP Foundation universe. 
They're the ones behind everything, hearing every whisper and pulling every string. And if you know anything about them, even the facts you just saw in this video, it's probably only because they want you to. When a hyper-aggressive lizard or an evil living cow heart starts rampaging through your town, or a sinister salesman turns up in your home, who are you gonna call? Hint, it's not the Ghostbusters. The answer is the SCP Foundation's Mobile Task Force. You probably heard them mentioned in every single video on this channel, but what exactly is a mobile task force? What do they do for the SCP Foundation? And what are some of the most famous mobile task forces in the field? Let's crack open the files and take a look. In short, mobile task forces are the Foundation's elite personnel, and each task force is generally made up of highly trained Foundation operatives with specific skill sets. These MTS aren't rooted in any one base and are relocated to wherever they're required, hence the mobile part of the name. The exact parameters on what an MTF can be is pretty flexible. The size of their units can vary from whole battalions of troops packing heavy artillery to small, tight-knit groups of intelligence-gathering spies. Some mobile task forces are bound to specific SCPs, whereas others perform more generalized tasks, such as securing certain facilities or territories. When the regular rank-and-file Foundation field agents can't do the job, the MTFs are brought in to pick up the pieces. Each group is controlled by a mobile task force commander, who reports to the Foundation director of task forces, though the actual organizational structure of each group varies. Sometimes MTFs, which were created for extremely specific purposes, are disbanded after that purpose is achieved. How many mobile task forces are there exactly? The exact number is shrouded in secrecy, and oftentimes the answer will depend on who you ask. But you're not here for what we don't know. You want to know the details on the biggest badasses under the Foundation's employ, and we intend to deliver. Much like our video on the proposals for SCP-001, we're going to give you a rapid-fire crash course on some of the most prominent and interesting Foundation task forces. And remember, if you want us to go more in-depth into the most exciting missions of any of these groups, let us know in the comments. But for now, it's time for a rundown of the Foundation's best of the best. MTF Alpha-1, aka Red Right Hand, are essentially the black ops of the SCP Foundation. They report directly to the O5 Council and conduct missions at the highest level of secrecy, with most of the information hidden behind a level 5 clearance wall. Many also believe Alpha-1 to have links to the infamous Chaos Insurgency, a splinter group at war with the Foundation. But if anyone asks, you didn't hear it from us. Seriously, we don't want to get assassinated. MTF Alpha 4, aka Pony Express, are a covert group deeply embedded into the world's logistics and postal services. The trafficking of anomalous objects is a worldwide issue, and it's up to Alpha 4 to intercept and keep a lid on those anomalous objects before they fall into the wrong hands. Think of them as a better funded, paranormal USPS police division. One object they've prevented from reaching the public is SCP-3060, a series of CPAP machines that cause nighttime visions of frightening entities. MTF Omega-7, aka Pandora's Box, was an experimental task force which incorporated the use of highly combat-effective SCPs, including SCP-076, better known as Abel. The test showed initial success, but after they ran out of missions, Abel's bloodlust proved to be too great for the team to control, and the experiment as well as the task force were scrapped. However, this led to the creation of MTF Alpha-9, aka Last Hope. This is a mobile task force designed to train viable SCPs to provide services to the Foundation out in the field. This group has learned the lessons of its predecessor and has employed the use of more measured and reasonable anomalies. Those include SCP-073 or Kane, the much more even-tempered brother of Abel. MTF Beta-7 aka the Maz Hatters are the elite cleanup crew for anomalous biohazards, chemical spills, and radiological disasters. So if an area suddenly looks like it's going to become Chernobyl's scarier sequel or an anomalous fast-spreading disease is wrecking havoc over a wide area, the Maz Hatters are the guys to call. They worked closely on the containment of SCP-1280, a kind of parasitic nematode worm that often injects false memories into their victims. MTF Gamma-5, aka Red Herrings, are the Foundation's chief disinformation division. They prevent the leaks of classified info to the public, and on the rare occasions that this information does somehow get out, they're in charge of burying it and administering necessary amnestic treatment to those affected. It's a thankless job, but you won't remember they did it either way. They gave amnestic treatment to the traumatized victims of SCP-1618, 
a malevolent urinal which replaced the user's valuables with disgusting alternatives, from toilet paper to pig intestines. NTF Gamma 6, aka Deep Feeders, investigate and track deep sea or oceanic anomalies, a job that commands the ultimate respect from people with thalassophobia – that's the fear of the deep ocean. If something terrifying and mysterious is stirring down there in the abyss, you better believe Gamma 6 are going to be the first ones down. They keep a close eye on a number of anomalies such as SCP-1264, an underwater amalgamation of sunken ships eager to drag down more vessels and add them to its mass. MTF Gamma-13, aka Asimov's Lawbringers, are a specialized task force devoted to investigating, tracking, and apprehending anomalies originating from Anderson Robotics, a group of interests that produces anomalous robots and machines. This includes examples of SCP-2806, a number of advanced anomalous prosthetic body parts that wish to attach themselves to a lacking host whether they want it or not. MTF Delta-5, aka Front Runners, are a large group of autonomous deep cover agents buried in various groups of interest across the globe. It's their job to gather intelligence from within to aid in the apprehension of anomalies before these groups can get their hands on them. They also sometimes make use of anomalies to track down others, such as when they requested to use SCP-185 a Russian R-105M radio used during the Cold War that can receive signals from any time period, including encrypted ones, but can also emit sound waves so powerful they can literally kill you. MTF Epsilon 9, aka Fire Eaters, are the Foundation's resident pyromaniacs. They're the ones sent into missions involving extremely high temperature environments, and they're also highly skilled in the use of powerful incendiary weapons. If the Foundation needs to burn or avoid getting burned, the Fire Eaters are the ones for the job. Their vital skills assisted in containing SCP-165, massive colonies of carnivorous, parasitic mites that eat prey to the bone. MTF Epsilon 11, Nine-Tailed Fox are another one of the most classified mobile task forces existing only under the oversight of the Red Right Hand. They work internally and are only dispatched to Foundation sites when standard protocols fail and multiple breaches are imminent. They were brought in to deal with the SCP-2139 incident, a strange psychological phenomenon that inexplicably increased the suggestibility of Foundation staff at Site-35. This made the infected staff agree with everything they heard. MTF Zeta-9, Mole Rats, are a task force that specializes in the exploration and containment of anomalous areas that are either enclosed or underground, particularly if, due to the effects of the anomaly, the space-time fabric of the area is unstable. You may remember them from our series on SCP-1730, the mission into and out of the anomalous Site-13. MTF Eta-10, aka See No Evil, are a team that specializes in taking on dangerous memes and cognito hazards that affect the victims through visual contact. One example is SCP-1561, a crown that when worn causes all those who see the person wearing the crown to imagine the wearer as their king and immediately adopt positions of servitude. While MTF Eta-10, aka Savage Beasts, serve the opposite purpose. They deal with musical or auditory anomalies and any cognito hazards that work through the medium of sound, like SCP-2402 a chord progression which can regenerate old or dying cells. MTF Theta-4, aka Gardeners, are a crack team of agents who face off against any botanical or plant-like anomalies. Their skills were put to use against SCP-1147, a collection of plum tree seeds which can grow out of literally any substance, even ones that are totally inorganic. MTF Theta-90, aka Angle Grinders, are a team that specialize in two of the most frightening things out there, anomalies and math. These brainiacs deal with anomalous mathematical issues, like warped topologies and geometries. Even listing an example of the kind of anomalies they deal with here will make your head hurt, so just be thankful they're out there. NTF IOTA 10, or Damn Feds, are a huge network of undercover agents based in federal and local law enforcement agencies across the globe. They intercept any anomalous objects, beings, or information and make sure that it makes its way out of police evidence lockers and into Foundation hands without incident. MTF Kappa 10, or Skynet, is a temporary team of combined meat space and virtual agents tracking down and disrupting anomalous cyber threats, such as SCP-2987, an external hard drive basically capable of turning artificial intelligences into living souls for trades with soul-consuming anomalies. MTF Lambda 5, aka White Rabbits, are a group that specializes in combating reality warpers of all types, whether they're messing with space-time or exhibiting godlike powers. Some anomalies even respond directly to them, like SCP-2440. 46, a phenomenon where corpses, often identical to living White Rabbit's team members, suddenly manifest around San Jose, California. 
NTF Lambda-12, pest control, are a group of agents who exclusively go after anomalous vermin. Incidentally, they are one of the only MTFs who have never lost members in the line of duty. Their purview includes SCP-2810, an anomalous pathogen that causes the victim cells to become tiny versions of their own species, like a human cells becoming cell-sized humans. MTF Lambda-14, one-star reviewers, are a task force that deal with retail-oriented anomalies. Their main focus has become combating a sinister group of interest known as the Ambrose Restaurant, a chain of extra-dimensional restaurants with strange and anomalous food and service. MTF Mu-3, aka Highest Bidders, is a mobile task force devoted to preventing the group of interest, Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited, from disseminating dangerous anomalous objects and then obtaining and containing these objects. One such object is SCP-2818, a number of 50 cal sniper rifles that, when fired, turns the shooter into a bullet and fires them. MTF Mu-4, aka Debuggers, are particularly useful in the modern age as they track and contain anomalous electronics and technology, including isolating and containing anomalous websites and software. One of the anomalies dealt with by the Debuggers is SCP-896, an online role-playing game that improves the physical and mental attributes of the player when they name their character after themselves. Remember when we said you didn't need to call the Ghostbusters? Well, that wasn't entirely true. Sometimes you need to get MTF Mu-13, aka Ghostbusters, on the line, since they're an MTF whose specialty is tracking intangible or incorporeal anomalies, particularly those considered sapient or sentient, and they're on call 24 hours a day to serve all your supernatural containment needs like when you're plagued by SCP-1036, which are a number of haunted Congolese fetish dolls. MTF Nu-7, aka Hammer Down, are the ones you need to call when you need real heavy-duty work. They're a huge force with a massive stock of army vehicles and heavy weaponry, and are only called in for truly catastrophic events. They're also assisted in the containment of SCP-939, the voice-imitating, amnestic-producing red monsters. MTF Epsilon-6, aka Village Idiots, are a group of agents whose specialty is investigating and containing anomalous phenomena that occur in rural or suburban areas. If you live in a small town and you're on the run from a vicious monster, you better hope the village idiots are on their way. They've contained SCP-2561, a cat with a vintage television set for a head, capable of causing painful tinnitus. MTF Pi-1, aka City Slickers, are pretty much the exact opposite of the village idiots. They pursue anomalies in densely populated urban areas, particularly in the New York metropolitan area. They assisted in the ongoing containment of SCP-1155, the incredibly bloodthirsty predatory street art. MTF Sigma-66, aka 16 Tons, are basically the Foundation's own version of the Suicide Squad. They're a team made from captured members of other groups of interest who aren't particularly loyal to the Foundation, but whose very particular set of skills make up for that fact. MTF Tau-5, aka Samsara, are another group you might remember from the events of SCP-1730. These are a group unlike any other, immortal cyborgs made from the flesh of a dead god who can be upgraded as needed. They're equipped with experimental and state-of-the-art Foundation technology to take on thaumaturgic, magical, and psionic threats. MTF Psi-7, aka Home Improvement, is a team specializing in structural anomalies. In plain speak, they deal with anomalous activities concerning buildings, containing, and sometimes even demolishing when necessary with a variety of heavy artillery. For example, they counteract the nightmarish SCP-3050, a building in North Carolina that once a year fuses all living matter inside its own structure on an atomic level. MTF Psi-8, aka the Silencers, are a team devoted to containing reanimation anomalies and those who've been affected by them. If you've just come back from the dead, then the Silencers are going to want to know your location. MTF Omega-0, aka Ara Orun, are another highly classified mobile task force that's actually the memories of deceased Foundation personnel preserved on the Foundation intranet system. Their job is to protect their surviving co-workers against informational threats mm -hmm. on the servers. They also contain SCP-3660. 64, a damaged but highly advanced assault rifle existing in the non-physical conceptual space. It can only be interacted with by thinking about interacting with it. And last but not least, MTF Omega-12, aka Achilles Heel, is an anomalous task force and these powerful reality warpers from another dimension hunt down dangerous and powerful reality warpers in ours. You can thank these guys for every single day that our reality continues on as normal, or whatever normal means now. They're enemies of SCP-3155, members of the iconic Pinkerton Detective Agency with anomalous abilities relating to combat. Alright, we did it! 
Of course, even this is only a sample of the vast number of mobile task forces at the Foundation's disposal who put their lives at risk every day to keep humanity, normality, and reality intact. They seem to have a task force perfectly tailored to every threat we could possibly encounter. And as new threats are cataloged, more mobile task forces are sure to arise to meet them. Want more in-depth explorations of any of these groups and their epic missions? Let us know in the comments below. Cunning, liar, enigmatic, and fearsome are just a few words used to describe a particular member of the SCP Foundation. While many of the Foundation's researchers and scientists are a pretty unusual bunch, to say the least, this one might just take the cake, and then might have said cake decommissioned in the most collaterally damaging way imaginable. Similar to the infamous Dr. Bright always switching bodies, appearing with all manner of ever-shifting faces, genders, and even species, this particular Foundation Department head is also no stranger to never looking the same way twice. In his case, he can't be photographed properly, at least not by any conventional means. Thanks to some unknown anomalous augmentation, any pictures taken of this researcher will have the face swapped with that of a random animal. However, these pictures will always feature the same characteristic grin much like the smile of a Cheshire cat, a notorious liar not to be trusted by anyone. Dr. Alto Clef is one of the SCP Foundation's strangest members of personnel. For starters, Dr. Alto Clef isn't even technically his real name, more a nickname that became synonymous with the mysterious scientist and served as a convenient shorthand for his alleged real name. You see, according to the entity most commonly known as Dr. Clef, his real name is actually a sound unpronounceable by human beings. His name is, apparently, the A major chord played on a ukulele. This explains why the strange doctor always carries the instrument around with him, should anyone wish to refer to him using his real name on a strum of those strings. In fact, he used to go by a completely different name, the Ukulele Man, and sometimes Agent Ukulele, thanks to his predilection for playing the string instrument. So where did the Alto Clef nickname come from? Well, that one's easy. Dr. Clef received this nickname thanks to his penchant for signing off reports with a hand-drawn Alto Clef symbol, a type of musical note. Dr. Clef had long been one of the more enigmatic and mysterious scientists working at the Foundation. He is perhaps more of an oddity than the elusive and infamous O5 Council themselves although that one is probably up for debate. Alto Clef was formerly an operative for the Global Cult Coalition, although he first attracted the attention of the SCP Foundation a while before then. A number of research papers Clef published at a redacted university happened to catch the Foundation's eye, mostly for their bizarre and lurid subject matter. Much of the content and even the title of some of his works are redacted, but what we do know is that one of Clef's papers describes certain traits that matched an existing SCP they had catalogued in their archive. There was no way this could have been a coincidence. Somehow Alto Clef had knowledge of the anomalous and had to be considered a potential risk to security. During a conversation with the agent that was sent to investigate his strange research papers, Alto Clef was able to convince her to offer him a job within the Foundation. It seems exceptionally unusual that Clef was able to pull this off, as most women working for the SCP Foundation have reported that the man possesses a positively slimy personality. So, why even bother to hire this guy if he seems to be such a creep? Well, it turned out that the acquisition of Dr. Clef wasn't without its advantages namely the capture and containment of SCP-447. This SCP, for anyone who might be unfamiliar, is an anomaly in two parts. The first, SCP-447-1, is a sphere composed entirely of a green, slime-like substance. It's warm to the touch, the same sort of heat as an ordinary human body, and has no adverse or harmful effects on anyone that comes into contact with it. SCP-447-2 is a viscous green slime that is excreted by the main ball. This excretion can be eaten or can increase the fuel efficiency of gasoline by 150% when they are mixed. The sphere and the substance are only known to be harmful when they come into contact with dead bodies, although what exactly occurs when this happens has been redacted by the O5 Council. Nonetheless, Dr. Alto Clef was reportedly instrumental in retrieving SCP-447, and given the usefulness of its slime to the Foundation, the doctor had, in turn, proved his own worth. 
The consensus seems to be that, while his personality might be annoying or even outright repulsive in some instances, Alto Clef is still able to perform his job with precision and competence, making the Doctor a useful asset to the SCP Foundation. During his time there, Clef became well known for being somewhat of a gun enthusiast as well. In fact, he earned his own brand of infamy for his habit of brutally decommissioning dangerous SCPs, and you can probably guess what we mean by that. In other words, Clef established himself as the Foundation's go-to executioner. Sometimes he's a little too good at his job, though. In one instance, Clef brought a chainsaw to work that he thought possessed supernatural properties. However, this happened to take place at the Foundation's annual costume party, causing the Doctor to think that a riot was taking place, thanks to personnel all being dressed as D-Class. Chainsaw in hand, Clef murdered half of his own research staff without a second thought. It also turned out that the chainsaw hadn't had any anomalous properties in the first place. That was an HR nightmare. Dr. Clef is renowned for having brutal efficiency, not shying away from causing the deaths of countless civilian lives during his decommissioning of anomalies. As long as he is able to kill or contain an SCP to further the course of science, or protect the majority of the civilian world, then Clef will view any possible deaths and collateral damage caused by his actions as acceptable losses. In short, he is a necessary evil. But perhaps Clef's best-known attempt at decommissioning an anomaly was during the SCP-239 incident. Also known by the nickname of the Witch Child, SCP-239 might appear to be a harmless eight-year-old child, but she's actually a powerful reality-bending anomaly with impervious, indestructible skin. Her capabilities are almost limitless and she can influence the world and people around her in virtually any way that she can imagine. As long as she is conscious and can see her surroundings, SCP-239 can create living matter or make it disappear, wishing things into or out of existence with as little as a simple thought. Or as her file in the SCP archive puts it, if she can see it, she can change it. Although SCP-239 was being contained by the Foundation, given a pre-approved list of spells that she was allowed to perform and kept calm at all times so she wouldn't think to cause harm to herself or anyone around her, Dr. Clef didn't think that this was adequate enough. In a report, he claimed that the Witch Child's containment wasn't suitable and that she posed a major security risk to the SCP Foundation and its personnel. You see, given his time with the Global Occult Coalition, Dr. Clef had become somewhat of an expert in anomalies with the ability to reshape reality, making him particularly wary of SCP-239. It was his proposal that the Foundation should not overestimate its own ability to contain these reality benders, and that they should instead strike first. Dr. Clef's idea was simple. Use some form of sharp implement to kill SCP-239. Of course, given the Witch Child's impenetrable skin, this is a lot easier said than done. But Clef had a few solutions handy to work around this. Firstly, his plan was that this decommissioning would be carried out at night when SCP-239 was asleep, and as a result, her reality-altering powers would be neutralized. Second, the implement used to kill her would be made out of SCP-148, the Telekill Alloy. This anomaly is a metal that the Foundation keeps stored in blocks that has the unique property of being able to block telepathic and mimetic effects. Now that plan on its own might sound fine on paper. That is, if you're on board with murdering an eight-year-old SCP while she's asleep, you monster. But there were a number of risks for Clef to consider. SCP-239 could wake up during her termination and would then be able to resist being killed. But another far more complicated risk was that SCP-239 could wake up, perceive the person carrying out her termination as a friend, as someone who wouldn't harm her, and her abilities would then alter the world around her to make this the case, changing reality to match. To try and avoid this outcome, Dr. Clef volunteered himself as the one who would carry out the procedure. With his mysterious past, dealing with reality-changing anomalies as a member of the Global Occult Coalition, he overzealously thought he was the only man cut out for the job. However, in his arrogance, Clef made the fatal mistake of transmitting his plan openly to Foundation personnel, instead of using secure encrypted channels. You see, over time, SCP-239 had formed bonds with a number of the Site-17 staff that had been assigned to her. Regardless of whether staff members had sympathy towards the girl, or because her perception of them had altered reality and bent their intentions, Dr. Kondraki had to step in and intervene. 
And of course, this led to an altercation between the two. Thanks to Kondraki's efforts, Dr. Kleff's proposed plan of decommissioning SCP-239, a defenseless, anomalous child, was thwarted. Even so, during the incident, Clef showed how remarkably and worryingly easy he found it to outwit the Foundation's defenses and security forces. Though he walked away from his attempted murder of SCP-239 with a few severe injuries, Clef's career wasn't impeded upon in the slightest. In fact, the O5 Council promoted him to the position of department head for the SCP Foundation's Division of Training and Development. Thanks to his reputation for swift, relentless, and surgically precise methods of terminating SCPs. However, Dr. Clef's actions during the SCP-239 incident prompted some within the Foundation to take a closer look at his past. A tricky thing to do, especially seeing as Clef is known to be a liar and not someone to be trusted, and that this has been a long-time habit of his that is unlikely to change. However, there does exist a service record for a global occult coalition operative who used to go by the codename of Ukulele. First recruited into the coalition in 1981, Ukulele was reported to have killed a number of known threat entities, or KTEs, but these usually came with the result of heavy casualties, including the deaths of other GOC operatives. One Colonel Richard Adams is quoted in Ukulele's service record as saying, does anyone know who this guy is or where he came from? He's good at what he does, right, but every time I ask him about his past, I get a completely different answer. Eventually, after 99 confirmed kills of anomalous entities, the operative known as Ukulele expressed a desire to return from active service within the Coalition. This request was granted, and sometime later he resurfaced working for the SCP Foundation under a new name, Dr. Alto Clef. Naturally, Dr. Clef has never confirmed nor denied that he is, in fact, ukulele, although his habit of playing the instrument does seem to imply that there is some sort of connection there. After all, that's not as strange as some of the other rumors floating around about our old friend Alto Clef. Some think he's an incarnation of the devil himself, or that he even married a goddess and had several children with her. Others claim Clef is the biological father of SCP-166 a girl with deer horns and the ability to make anything man-made corrode. Then again, you'd be better off coming up with your own answer than asking Dr. Clef about his past. He's hardly likely to give you a straight answer, providing he doesn't accidentally kill you on the spot. The Global Occult Coalition, better known as the GOC, are a group of bloodthirsty, gun-toting cowboys who shoot first and ask questions later. Whether it's a helpful sentient chair or a little girl whose only anomalous quality is manifesting flowers and ice cream, the GOC have only one response. Destroy. Burn it. Crush it. Shoot it in the face with extreme prejudice. And be home in time for dinner. Or at least that's what plenty of SCP Foundation devotees would have you believe. But if we only judged an organization by the words of its greatest opponents, we'd be dealing with an extremely one-sided picture. Are they gun-ho morons who regularly blunder into complex situations and make everything worse with either plain ignorance or outright malice? Or are they humanity's true defenders, working on behalf of the world's democratically elected leaders rather than the uncountable mystery of the Foundation? As with most things in life, the answer is often found somewhere in the middle. That's why today, we're going to take a closer look at the United Nations' answer to the anomalous threats that inhabit our world. Who are they? What do they believe? And what are some of their greatest victories and failures? The inception of what we now know as the Global Occult Coalition began during the Seventh Occult War, which occurred during World War II. The Nazi SS Achnerbe and the Tull Gesellschaft attempted to complete a ritual known as the Rite of Solomon, which would have given them terrifying supernatural power. This was the first time that a number of world governments understood the true scope of the paranormal threat out there, and after the war concluded, with many dead, they wanted to make sure this could never happen again. Of course, the SCP Foundation works in cooperation with all world governments, but ultimately they still have autonomy, and no one nation could ever shoulder the responsibility of protecting all of humanity either, lest nationalism and self-interest get in the way of the mission. The United Nations needed their own organization that was completely accountable to them and them alone in order to protect themselves from paranormal threats, or 
parathreats, and thus the Global Occult Coalition was born. As the coalition part of the name suggests, the GOC is an umbrella term for 108 different paranormal organizations, all gathered under the shared goal of protecting humanity from parathreats and fostering continued positive relationships between paranormal groups. Its member groups include, but are in no way limited to, the Bavarian Illuminati, the International Center for the Study of Unified Thaumatology, the Reformed Holy Order of the Knights Templar, Servants of the Silicon Nornir, the United Church of Satan Science Division, the World Para Health Organization, and the Universalist Order of the Air Seer. Yeah, it's a lot to take in, but don't worry, there won't be a quiz later. These groups and many more unite under the Global Occult Coalition's five-fold mission. Understanding these five missions is vital to understanding why the GOC works in the way it does, and why it differs from the Foundation. Mission 1. Survival This is the primary directive of the GOC, ensuring the survival of humanity in the face of parathreats. Mission 2. Concealment Much like the Foundation, the GOC seeks to conceal knowledge of parathreats from the public that could cause mass panic or loss of life. Mission 3. Protection In an interesting departure from the somewhat colder Foundation perspective, the GOC also prizes the safety of individual humans, including its own personnel. Mission 4. Destruction This mission is perhaps the biggest difference between the GOC and the Foundation, and is often what defines them in the public eye. The GOC considers the very existence of parathreats to be a danger to the survival of humanity, so no risks are taken to ensure their survival. And finally, Mission 5, Education. The GOC seeks to expand their knowledge base in regards to the parathreats they face across the globe. Clearly, the Global Occult Coalition knows where they stand. Many have positioned the GOC as villains to the Foundation's more level-headed approach, but arguments could also be made in the GOC's favor when it comes to killing off rather than studying anomalies. The number of deaths caused in containment breaches of parathreats that could have been executed immediately after being captured is one persuasive argument, as is the continued potential threat of parathreats currently sitting in containment. And while the GOC has been called inhumane for its desire to murder parathreats, Ask any member of D-Class personnel whether the SCP Foundation is a more ethical organization in comparison. While the Foundation are generally far more considerate with anomalies than the GOC, their attitude towards their human cannon fodder is just as cold. Of course, we're not saying either organization is right or wrong in this instance. More that it's a nuanced issue that's difficult to look at in terms of morality. Later, we'll take a look at two of the most famous case studies to see how the GOC's methodology plays out on the field. But first, let's take a look at how the actual organization is structured. At the top of the tower is the Council of the 108. Much like the United Nations, this council is made up of representatives from each of the 108 member organizations of the GOC. Below that is the High Command headed by the mysterious Undersecretary General D.C. Alfine, believed to be a woman who is living somewhere in Europe, as well as the Nexus. The Nexus directs a network of command central hubs to coordinate and support local operations. Below that, the GOC is separated into three prongs, the Physics Division, the Psyche Division, and the Ptolemy Division. The Physics Division is the action arm of the GOC, made up of assessment teams and strike teams, it's their job to investigate and capture or neutralize parathreats. The Psyche Division is the diplomatic sector of the GOC and consists of special observers and ambassadors. These personnel maintain relationships between paranormal groups and keeps things smooth between normal humanity and the occult. The Ptolemy Division is known as the support arm and is home to the quartermasters and the research and development department. This division helps the other two divisions do their work from managing logistics and resource distribution to developing state-of-the-art weapons and equipment for GOC personnel. One more quick note before we move on to two of the GOC's greatest hits. It's important to know that the GOC classifies anomalies different to how the SCP Foundation does. Rather than SCPs, the GOC refers to them as TEs, or threat entities. While the GOC employs a frankly baffling number of code words for various groups, ideas, or concepts that we don't have the time to get into right now, we can tell you the main types of TEs. There are KTEs, or Known Threat Entities, UTE, or Unknown Threat Entities, PTEs, Potential Threat Entities, 
and LTEs, or Liquidated Threat Entities, which are threat entities they have confirmed to be destroyed. Now you should have a pretty good idea of who the Global Occult Coalition is, their member organizations, their mission statements, their major ideological differences from the SCP Foundation. But it's a common truism that actions speak louder than words. So we need to talk about two of the most infamous incidents in the organization's history. First, there's the chair. Known as KTE-0937 Velveteen, or 6th Chair to the Global Occult Coalition, and SCP-1609 to the SCP Foundation. This is an incident that the Foundation and Foundation supporters love to cite when criticizing the GOC. From their telling, 1609 was an innocent, if a little spooky looking chair with a harmless anomalous property. It teleports behind people who want to sit down. In spite of how helpful and benign this is, the Global Occult Coalition did what they always do, and decided to neutralize it by forcing it into a wood chipper. However, this didn't actually kill the chair. It merely transformed it into a collection of sentient wood chips with an understandable chip on its shoulder. Now, when angered, typically by mentions of things related to the GOC or by the sound of motors running, these chips teleport into people's lungs, causing fatal organ damage. Surely this shows that the GOC are a bunch of haphazard idiots. They transformed a harmless anomaly into a killer. Well, it's not that simple. According to their own telling of the incident with the sixth chair, it was exactly that. Just the sixth and a number of other parathreats being destroyed because of their relation to a dangerous parathreat creator known as the Carpenter. All five other items were successfully incinerated. The chair was only unsuccessfully neutralized with the wood chipper due to a machine error with the incinerator. In other words, what is often painted as a prime example of GOC brashness and incompetence could just as easily have been a total accident that occurred during an otherwise logical action. No different from the fatalities that often occur during an SCP Foundation containment breach. But let's look at another example. SCP-1522, known to the GOC as LTE-4201 Velveteen, or the Ghost Ships. The Foundation often cites this as being another textbook example of the GOC taking things too far, and murdering a completely innocent anomaly minding its own business. This anomaly was two apparently sapient boats in the middle of the ocean that showed compassion for one another giving them the reputation of being literal love boats. The GOC apparently objected to this union and blew one of the boats to kingdom come, leaving the other to self-terminate in grief. How can the GOC possibly come out as anything but monsters in this scenario, harming two wholesome anomalies that would never hurt a fly? Well, don't be so sure about that. From the GOC report, we can first see that the boats were already encroaching into human territory, leading to reports of ghost ships from fishermen trawling in that area. And while the GOC did admittedly fire the first shot, it cannot be denied that the surviving ship's retaliation was equally, if not more, violent than the initial attack. Upon attacking the first of the two ships, the second willfully collided with the GOC vessel, manned by the strike team Ocean Thunder, at hypersonic speeds. This killed the entire GOC team present. While it's easy to say that this attack was in self-defense, it also shows that the boats always had devastating combat potential if provoked. If the parathreat had performed the same act on a larger navy ship, or on a cruise ship or any kind of commercial vessel, hundreds of lives would be lost. Doesn't seem so innocent now, does it? What conclusion can we draw from all this? Is the Global Occult Coalition a gaggle of bloodthirsty idiots looking to kill off anomalies for the sake of it? No. Are they a morally perfect organization? protecting human survival and the quality of human life from a foundation that couldn't care less? The answer is no here too. While the SCP Foundation and the GOC have been known to squabble and have caused even more damage to one another in alternate realities, they're ultimately two sides of the same coin. The two have even been known to reluctantly collaborate when necessary. Perhaps they don't always see eye to eye, especially on some of the smaller and more contentious anomalies but in a world where cosmic nightmares are lurking just behind the fabric of our reality, and some are preparing to strike, it feels comforting to have both of them at the ready. Congratulations! You've just entered the employ of the SCP Foundation as a junior researcher. As you know, the Foundation doesn't just hand out positions like this to anyone. To get scouted as part of their research corps, you need to be one of the best and brightest. 
you're going to be working with strange, mind-bending, and sometimes even deadly anomalies on a daily basis. You're part of the thin, redacted line between normalcy and absolute chaos of the supernatural. But right now, only one question is on your mind. Where will you actually be working? Because here's the thing. The SCP Foundation is a worldwide organization devoted to the containment of the anomalous, and they have thousands of classified sites and areas across the globe, each of them specializing in a different subset of the strange. Depending on your particular area of expertise, there's a number of Foundation facilities you may hope to be assigned to, but that's not what we're talking about today. Instead, we're focusing on the sites and areas so dangerous that just getting assigned there feels kind of like a demotion to D-Class, the places with the deadliest anomalies and the most frightening locales. That's right, it's time to cross your fingers and hope for the best. Because today, we're going to discuss the most dangerous SCP Foundation sites and areas. But first, there are some things we need to understand about Foundation facilities in general. If you're somewhat familiar with the world of the SCP Foundation, you've probably heard phrases like research site and biological containment area thrown around a lot. You may have even picked up most of the meanings from context clues. But before we throw you into even more dangerous, uncharted waters, we're gonna break down the labels for you. The Foundation has secure facilities all over the world, and they deal with a wide range of different anomalies, so these facilities often have to specialize to suit the requirements of their specific task. For starters, the terms site and area aren't interchangeable. Sites are covert Foundation facilities that often exist relatively close to civilian populations, so as not to arouse suspicion from the public or rival groups like the Chaos Insurgency. They disguise themselves as boring government and corporate buildings. Areas, on the other hand, typically have to contain much more dangerous anomalies. Areas tend to not only be much larger than sites, they're also further away from civilian population centers. There's no cover story here. The areas are just entirely hidden. They also often have some pretty crazy failsafe measures in case of a large containment breach like one or even multiple thermonuclear warheads designed to detonate and blow the facility to kingdom come, if things ever get truly out of control. It goes without saying that you'd probably rather be assigned to a site rather than an area, if you're risk adverse. Both types of facilities are divided into sections or sectors, which in some cases are further divided into units. Units typically are small, high-security areas devoted to the extensive containment of a single anomaly, or several closely related anomalies. Now that you know the two types of facilities, let's talk prefixes. The handy little descriptor that often clues you in to how a Foundation site or area has specialized. There are 10 possible prefixes for a facility, and we'll take you on a quick crash course through those before we start getting dangerous. Armed as in armed site, armed area, or armed section, refers to a facility or section that possesses a large quantity of firepower and could mean military-grade weaponry, vehicles, or just a large number of permanent armed guards. Armed facilities tend to be more dangerous to work in, either due to a greater threat of containment breach or due to a high possibility of attacks from the outside. Biological or bio implies that the facility or area deals with infectious or biohazardous anomalies that would make catching the Black Plague feel like a spa day. Containment is an obvious one. These sites or areas that are, you guessed it, built for containing anomalies. Dimensional containment facilities or sections often contain dangerous pocket dimensions or gateways into other dimensions. Humanoid containment facilities or sections deal largely with intelligent human or human-like anomalies, capable of understanding and following instructions. They're similar to standard prisons, but for anomalous people. Protected facilities and sections are anomaly-free safe zones, so we won't be discussing them much here. Provisional facilities are typically temporary facilities built around an anomaly that couldn't be feasibly transported to a pre-existing facility. The rare reliquary facilities or sections are designed to hold anomalous artifacts of a religious or historical nature. 
Research facilities or sections either research the anomalies themselves or work on devising new containment methods. And storage facilities are designed to store non-anomalous items long-term. The Foundation also has observation outposts, but, with some rare exceptions, your greatest risk at one of these is dying of boredom. With that out of the way, let's get to what we've all been waiting for. The scariest, deadliest, and most overall dangerous facilities on the Foundation roster. The places you'd never want to be assigned to if your life depended on it. And in this case, it really does. First, we'll discuss the most dangerous sites, and then the most dangerous areas. So grab your Foundation-issued sidearm, and let's go. First, Site 19. It shouldn't be surprised that the largest operating Foundation site is also the one containing some of the most famous and deadly prisoners. Two in particular are the one you can't look away from, and another that puts you in lifelong mortal danger if you look at it. These are SCP-173 The Sculpture and SCP-689 The Statue of Death. If you get assigned to Site-19, there's a possibility you may suddenly find yourself with a snapped neck while filling in spreadsheets. And if you so much take a glance at SCP-689, you'll be declared an E-Class, and possibly even terminated by your superiors. Second Provisional Site-4511, home of SCP-4511 also known as the Swine God. This giant pig-shaped furnace has had a terrifying effect on the Foundation personnel stationed at the site. In just a few weeks, it had seemingly rational researchers and guards performing brutal sacrifices in its name and ascending into an occult hell. It's happened at least once already and is extremely likely to happen again, so you definitely want to avoid being deployed here. But the most deadly site of all is one that doesn't even come from our universe. Site 13, also known as SCP-1730. This site, run by director Elliot Emerson, functioned like an anomaly slaughterhouse in another dimension. Anomalies were murdered and burned, and dissenting Foundation employees were treated horrifically. But when Director Emerson happened to turn on the reality-warping Thresher machine, this site became a full-blown nightmare filled with escaped SCPs, memetic hazards, otherworldly nightmare gods, and a truly unsavory entity nicknamed Leech Boy, who is quite interested in drinking your blood. If you can even survive long enough in Site-13 to meet him, that is. Of course, it's the secure Foundation areas where the horrors really unfold. These can make some of the worst sites look mild in comparison. Let's take a look at some of the Foundation's most dangerous areas. First, Containment Area 25B. This area is not only 200 meters beneath the ocean, it's also one of the most heavily fortified and one of the few to actually detonate its on-site nuclear warhead in the past. That's because this is the containment area for SCP-076, also known as Abel. This anomaly has frequent and extreme violent containment breach attempts, often brutally slaughtering staff in the process with his deft swordsmanship. Accepting a job here is a great way to fast-track yourself into becoming human sushi. Next up is Area 354. This facility houses SCP-354, also known as the Blood Pond, a slowly expanding pool of red liquid that habitually unleashes dangerous monsters that attack the guards stationed there. These include giant bats, huge metal spheres releasing concentrated radiation beams, a giant reptilian humanoid impervious to gunfire, and an invisible robotic Terminator entity that managed to murder 90% of the attending guards before being killed itself. In other words, not a recipe for stable employment. Area 126 is dangerous for a number of reasons. First, that it's located inside war-torn Damascus, Syria, and thus sometimes come under threat from shelling operations. Second, because it contains SCP-3989. This spatial anomaly in the middle of an olive orchard turned out to be a front for a terrifying sarcic dimension full of fleshy abominations. What's more, simply being in this area slowly caused the staff to lose their minds and become devoted to the Sarkic deities hidden within the dimension. And much like the Blood Pond, it's believed that this area of influence is actively growing day by day. 
meaning if you work at Area 126, it's actually getting less safe with each moment that passes. Next, Arm Reliquary and Containment Area 02. This base is specifically designed to contain highly dangerous, hostile, or otherwise hazardous anomalies, including multiple Keter-class objects. And we're not kidding when we say dangerous and hostile. The anomalies housed on this site are so dangerous, there's a literal battalion of armed guards to keep the peace. It also has not one, but multiple fail-safe nuclear weapons, designed to literally erase the entire base from existence if ever there's a catastrophic containment breach. One particularly horrifying anomaly in Area 02 is SCP-743. This is a seemingly innocent chocolate fountain that actually contains billions of extremely violent ant-like creatures that will swarm anything nearby, tearing it to pieces and dragging the pieces back to their nest inside the fountain. These insects will stop at nothing and can even tear through titanium if they need to in order to get their desired sustenance. So being present in this area means your life is constantly at risk. Hope you like chocolate. Next is the dreaded Armed Biological Containment Area 14, which contains some of the deadliest biological anomalies out there. From the bloodthirsty, kill-crazed Heart of Darkness SCP-058, to the head-devouring cannibal giant SCP-082, to the voice-imitating, memory-wiping, red-pack hunters SCP-939. This base also houses several fast-breeding killer parasites and a few highly infectious and deadly diseases. While Area 14 does boast an entire army of guards with heavy military hardware for preventing all these terrifying monsters from breaching containment and causing havoc, that probably won't make you feel much better. If even one of these things escapes at any given time, you better hope for your family's sake that you have a good life insurance policy. And finally, Area 37. As it stands, being sent to this area pretty much guarantees either death or a fate even worse than dying. That's because Area 37 is no longer under the control of the SCP Foundation. Instead, it's become a twisted playground for SCP-1765, a trio of terrifying reality warpers known as the Sisters. These unstoppable monsters claimed the area as their own, and began performing sickening experiments such as being forced into maddening time loops designed to drive you insane, or being crushed and burned to death in deadly games with confusing rules. While heading into other areas offers the possibility of a gruesome fate, Area 37 offers a dead certainty. Now, not only do you know the difference between different types of sites and areas, you now know some of the most horrifying and deadly examples of each so you know which to avoid. But look on the bright side. If you're hard up for work and the SCP Foundation seems like an appealing job, at least you know there will likely always be a position available at one of these sites. After all, positions here open up very frequently. You're a researcher working at Site-19 for the SCP Foundation just going about your day, minding your own business. You've spent your morning keeping an eye on the D-Classes who are keeping their eyes on SCP-173. The clock strikes noon, and you decide to break for lunch, where you'll enjoy the delicious tuna sandwich you made for yourself this morning. You're sitting alone in one of Site-19's numerous employee break rooms, chewing the first bite of your sandwich as you try in vain to wrap your head around SCP-055. The unknowable anti-meme, when a scent wafts past your nose. It's the worst thing you've ever smelled. Like a mix of body odor, dirt, and musty old clothes. You turn to look for the source of the smell, and suddenly realize that you're not alone in the room. There's a man standing next to you. He's tall, with a scruffy face lined by age. He's wearing a long woolen coat that dangles past his knees. He doesn't say a word though. He's just staring but not at you, at your sandwich. Before you can open your tuna-filled mouth to say something, his greatcoat opens, and a long green tentacle slithers out grabbing your sandwich and pulling it out of your hands. You start to protest, and then another limb emerges from the coat, long and reptilian. It places a single finger upon your lips and shushes you. The tentacle lifts your delicious tuna sandwich up to the strange man's face and he starts to eat it in front of you maintaining eye contact the entire time. 
Then after he finishes your lunch, he just turns and makes his exit, leaving you alone in the break room and hungry. Later that day, you request a meeting with your supervisor, hoping to get some answers about what you saw in the break room. Maybe some compensation for the stolen sandwich. Or at the very least, a little sympathy for how hungry you've been all afternoon. But your supervisor does none of that. Instead, the color drains from their cheeks and they begin to sweat. You ask what's wrong, and your supervisor murmurs one brief sentence. You just met the most powerful person in the world. Of course you've heard of the O5 Council. They're the most powerful people in the entire SCP Foundation, both in terms of institutional control and perhaps even literal raw power. Depending on who you ask, they might be a group of elite Foundation agents and researchers who rose to the very top of the pyramid, a secret room full of dusty, old, power-hungry bureaucrats, or a cabal of superpowered beings that transcend the bounds of our dimension. In short, almost nobody is more powerful than the Foundation's O5 Council. But who oversees the Overseers, if anyone at all? If they do exist, then who's the one figure in Foundation lore more secret than the most secretive group imaginable? There's only one answer to this question. A figure known only as… The Administrator. If you spent some time researching the affairs of the SCP Foundation, there's no doubt you would have heard the name. Perhaps in a heavily redacted file, or whispered in fear by a site director worrying about incurring the mysterious figure's wrath. Today we intend to do the impossible, and we just might end up terminated by the red right hand because of it. But we're going to gather all the information available to us, and try to figure out who or what the clandestine administrator actually is. We'll answer your most obvious question first. What's with those weird sandwich-stealing arms? One of the few almost universally accepted facts about the administrator is their possession of SCP-262 also known as the Coat of Many Arms. Little to nothing is known about the coat's history before it came into the Administrator's possession, and given the huge amount of power the Administrator wields within the Foundation, nobody has the authority to press them for further information. The coat's interior is a spatial anomaly, from which a huge number of anomalous limbs can emerge and perform tasks on the wearer's behalf. It's such a useful item that the Foundation has even considered weaponizing it for field agents as the arms emerging from the coat are able to perform tasks as diverse as playing the piano with two or more hands, to blocking attacks directed towards the wearer that otherwise would have been fatal. The limbs themselves are also varied, from normal-looking human limbs to tentacles and paws. The administrator only finally surrendered the coat to the Foundation in the end because it was taking up too much space in their closet, and presumably needed the room for the next season's most fashionable anomalous clothing. For centuries, though, you wouldn't see the Administrator without the many-armed coat. That's right, centuries. Another almost universally accepted fact about the Administrator is that they have a truly freakish longevity, potentially living for hundreds of years. There has likely been more than one Administrator during the Foundation's extremely long history, but each one has survived longer than any average human. It's also a widely believed theory that the Administrator may have been a key player in the Foundation's initial creation, too. There's been a number of potential names speculated for the Administrator, including Frederick Williams, Agnes Peterson, Kismet, and the sinister alias, the Spider. Some believe the Administrator to be fundamentally human despite certain anomalous qualities, while others speculate that they're the furthest thing from human. This interpretation maintains that the Administrator is an entity from a different dimension known as the Plane Where Eyes Can't Follow, and has a freakish body made from a twisted charcoal-like material tangled with wire mesh and a chaos of different limbs, all hidden under SCP-262. But hey, the Administrator species isn't nearly as interesting as their potential role within the Foundation. An issue surrounded with nearly as much confusion and controversy as, well, everything else about them. And just like everything else with the SCP Foundation, the line they feed the public is often different to the words circulating within the Foundation's higher clearance levels. If you want to believe the official stories, then the Administrator is the liaison between the Foundation and the numerous world governments that need to cooperate with them to ensure the successful capture of anomalies. 
The administrator is only allowed to edit SCP files, not actually write them due to apparent conflicts of interest. In many ways, the administrator is presented as your typical sleazy Washington insider, schmoozing with politicians and government figures to make sure they remain sympathetic to the Foundation's cause. According to observations from people outside the Foundation who've worked with the mysterious figure, they have a penchant for finely tailored suits, expensive aged liqueurs, and the amorous company of women. Despite being a bit of a drunken horn dog, though, people tend to describe the administrator as likable and easy to get along with regardless of where you fall on the political spectrum. They're also respected by many, and whenever something upsets them, even powerful world leaders are eager to try and appease them. Maybe because they are described as being freakishly strong when the situation demands it. Hey, even world leaders can change their minds when they have their arms twisted, literally. While there's nothing too outwardly bizarre about this iteration of the administrator, we don't actually know how much of this is true. A fact that really shouldn't surprise you by now. And if being well versed in the world of SCPs has taught you anything, it's that the SCP Foundation's PR and disinformation teams are not to be trusted. So who can be trusted? Is there any perspective on this mysterious figure that can be taken reliably? The short answer is… no, not really. But we do have the next best thing. Recollections from some of the Foundation's most trusted researchers and personnel, and even some of the strange historical figures that have heard about or even run into the Administrator. What follows are some of their answers to the question, who is the Administrator? Professor Kane Pathos Crow said, Oh, he's just something people talk about over lunch or when they're in between assignments. It kills time, and it's a fun game to speculate on who really calls the shots in this crazy world. Field agent Fritz Willie said, I like to tell people he's my brother. Foundation researcher Dr. Snorlison said, I'd like to poke at him and see what happens, just to see if any of the rumors about being made entirely of legs and toes are true, or something like that at least. Director Neil Ghost said, No big deal, son. The ever-stoic Dr. Charles Gears said, There are no records of anyone by that name working for the Foundation. Dr. Iceberg said, Whatever the boss man says goes. I'm not on staff to care about last decade's rumors. Dr. Glass said, I never met the guy. Heard he's pretty interesting, though. I'd love to sit down and have a chat with him, but he's probably too busy. I've never even gotten a call back about it. The wildcard Dr. Alto Clef said, Who? Dr. Chelsea Elliott said, I've actually done some research on him. Earliest records are about 60 years ago, and beyond that there's some vague references to a leader. Most of the records, though, are incomplete or just references by name, not much of substance. Dr. Frederick Hayden said, Please leave me alone. Dr. Jack Bright said, Yeah, I've heard the guy you're talking about. He's just a legendary thing from way back in the day. When we thought there were 1205s, we said he was there to be the tiebreaker. People don't talk about him much now anymore, probably because we don't need icons like that to keep people together. Dr. Jacob Kensington said, I think he bought me lunch once? Dr. Wright said, I heard he lives up in a big tower at Overwatch and he watches down on the O5s from the back of a mighty scaled dragon and he flies the skies for free. Uh, or something like that. You'll have to wait until I finish the book to hear the whole story. Dr. Kondraki said, Well, we can't tell you exactly what he said, but it was short and to the point and he was later disciplined for his use of rather rude language. In an interview later suppressed by the SCP Foundation, acclaimed horror writer Stephen King said of his interaction with the administrator, One of the oddest things to happen to me out on the road was an autograph session, in Westbrook, I think. A larger gentleman approached the table with a copy of The Stand, said he was a big fan. Now I think I might have been a little crazy here, but when I looked at his hand holding the book, it was green. I asked if he was okay and I looked up into his eyes. They were green too. He said he was fine. It was... Pretty scary stuff. Dr. Tilda D. Moose said, No. No, I don't even think we humor that one anymore. It's like the mid-tier research staff telling the new people there's a pool on the third floor. Nobody really believes it, but a couple people every year try and ask just to, uh, check. But yes, it's, uh, more or less dead rumor. And Dr. Django Bridge said, Sure, I know him. He hangs out at the pool on the fifth floor. So we return to our original question. Who is the administrator? Do they rule the SCP Foundation or serve it? Are they an anomalous human or a straight-up monster? 
Are they a liquor-loving political schmoozer greasing the palms of the world's government? Or a mysterious demigod who founded the Foundation and guides it on its quest to contain the anomalous and protect normality? The fact is, we don't know. And thanks to Foundation misinformation campaigns, we may never know. But much like the anti-meme, the administrators defined as much by what we don't know as what we do. And according to all sources, that's exactly how they like it. But what do you think is the truth about the administrator? Just who exactly is lurking under that coat, if anyone at all? It is an old adage that money makes the world go round. And when you work for the SCP Foundation, that same money can keep the world from ending. Think for a second about the kind of absurd bills that the SCP Foundation racks up. They need to pay for the upkeep on hundreds of facilities while also paying for thousands of employees as well as stipends for the families of the many, 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 many members of personnel who are killed in the line of duty. They also need to pay for the equipment required to do their jobs, a lot of which they need to develop themselves, as well as the expenses of varied containment procedures for well over 6,000 different anomalies, each one requiring its own unique treatment. And that's not even factoring in the costs of their various experiments, vehicles, weaponry, and cover-up operations. To say the Foundation would need billions upon billions of dollars to do what they do is probably lowballing it. So today, we feel like asking the big question. How does the SCP Foundation make all this money? Because personally, we just don't think the biannual Foundation bake sale is going to cover the price tag on this thing. First, we're going to explore the different ways the Foundation probably brings in its obscene budget through more traditional means. But if you stick around to the end, we'll explore some of the much more strange and exciting ways the Foundation can financially exploit its vast cache of anomalies, as well as a way that you, that's right, you, can help. So buckle up as we tackle the most terrifying monster of all, budgeting. The most obvious means the Foundation has of scraping up a little extra cash is to cooperate with world governments. Obviously, the SCP Foundation isn't a puppet of the United Nations like the GOC, it operates with a high degree of autonomy that prevents its work from ever being biased by certain national or international interests. However, in order to do its work properly, it does collaborate with various governments across the globe. Naturally, as a result of this, it does receive assisted funding from governments when combating or containing anomalies that would present a threat to their national security. Think of it as a classic you-scratch-my-back-I-scratch-yours situation. But seeing as people would notice every single government on Earth farming out billions of dollars for seemingly no reason that the profit could account for, it's clear that this only accounts for one of the SCP Foundation's multiple income streams. Where else is all the money coming from? Well, a phrase you've probably heard a lot on the video on this channel is front businesses. As any members of the Mafia in our audience will already know, a front business is a seemingly legitimate company used to hide the operations of a more secretive or illicit business going on behind the scenes. Typically, it's a boon for organized crime syndicates who need to justify the purchases of certain personnel or equipment or launder ill-gotten gains into clean, legitimate taxable revenue streams. Cause trust us kids, the only three letters scarier than SCP are IRS. The SCP Foundation makes use of a huge number of front organizations to both hide its operations and supplement its income. From chemical plants to office buildings to local bakeries, it is impossible to know just how many normal industries technically answer to the O5 Council high enough up the chain. For all you know, you could already be an employee of the SCP Foundation without even being aware of it. Income generated by the various front companies used by the Foundation are likely to make up a good chunk of their budget. Another key factor in the Foundation's profitability is technology. Given that the Foundation has gathered some of the greatest scientific and engineering minds in the world to protect humanity from anomalous forces, it goes without saying that they create some incredible technology, which may later trickle down into wider commercial and civilian use. And before you start saying this is crazy, it's actually an incredibly common practice with regular militaries all over the globe. Duct tape, superglue, GPS, silly putty, EpiPens, microwaves, and the internet were all made possible by military advancements. And with the Foundation having technology so advanced it puts even the most well-funded militaries to shame, it's sure to have some lucrative patents floating around out there. 
Not to mention the fact that the Foundation has also reclaimed and repurposed anomalous technology that surpasses even their own, which may influence some incredibly profitable consumer goods further down the line. Which is a nice segue to the next portion of this video. Utilizing captured anomalies for fun and profit. Well, mostly profit in this case. <laughs> this is the much more fun and theoretical half of things, where we speculate on which SCPs would bring in the biggest bucks to fill the coffers of the SCP Foundation. And of course, stick around to the end for the most important money-making method of all. It won't be what you expect. First, SCP-096. We know what you're thinking, how do we monetize a mindless killing machine? Simple. We stand someone in front of it and make them look at its face, then position 096 onto a treadmill attached to a series of powerful generators. Given that 096 literally never gets tired, we will have invented a true perpetual motion machine, and the energy generated by this could replace the municipal power grid. That's surely got to be worth a few bucks, right? United States government, the foundation awaits your call. Okay, okay, let's get a little more serious. Have you ever heard the expression, a penny saved is a penny earned? Because as previously discussed, one of the major costs of the Foundation is labor. However, SCP-662, the butler's handbell that summons the unfailingly loyal Mr. Deeds, could solve this issue. You may be thinking, sure, Mr. Deeds can replace the labor of a couple people, but not that many, he's got physical limitations. To which we would answer, what about SCP-662 put through SCP-914 the clockworks on fine? We'd wager that this might lead to a bell that summons an even more effective Mr. Deeds, or better yet, multiple Mr. Deeds. You could only imagine the money the SCP Foundation would save. Upon request, he can also manifest bricks of pure gold. He's a butler that literally pays for himself. But enough about Mr. Deeds. Let's talk about you. Are you happy? Fulfilled? Do you know why you're here? A lot of people struggle with finding a sense of purpose in life. It can make it difficult to form and actualize your goals. If only it was easy to know your greatest desire, so you could finally get your life together and start working on it. Thankfully, the Foundation could help. For a price. What? You can't blame them for a little hashtag hustle. With SCP-978, the desire camera, they could help people figure out what their deepest desire is. But that's not the only way to make money from this anomalous device. By taking pictures of the rich and powerful, and seeing if their desires are compromising, humiliating, or even illegal, you can quickly solicit some very generous donations out of them in exchange for keeping this juicy information under wraps. Podcasts are big these days, with incredibly popular ones like the Joe Rogan Experience getting around 11 million downloads per episode. People love hearing a compelling interview or a good story. That's why, to make a little money on the side, we recommend the Foundation give SCP-1867, a talkative telepathic sea slug who goes by Lord Blackwood, his own podcast, where he would spin wild yarns, interview celebrity guests, and perhaps even host chats with other interesting SCPs. All while the Foundation cleans up on sweet, sweet podcast sponsorship revenue. What, are you telling us you wouldn't tune in? I would. SCP-5094, Miss J's Whiz Kid Schoolhouse, could also be converted into expensive, over-the-counter proprietary software. Think of the money that companies like Skillshare and Masterclass rake in. Miss J could guarantee perfect learning through her intensive courses, and once the word of her efficacy spreads, she might even replace traditional higher education. And who would be the financial beneficiary? The SCP Foundation. Then there's SCP-2430, the immortal Hitler clone. He's unable to die, but feels pain at a heightened degree of sensitivity than most normal people. He's also, um, well, no getting around this, Hitler. And if the Foundation were able to go public about the existence of this clone, they could also take him out on tour across the globe and charge 10 to 15 bucks to punch him. People would be lining up to take a crack at the ex-Führer, and the Foundation would, of course, be the sole financial beneficiaries. Now, let's talk about pizza. The most popular pizza chain in the United States, as of this writing, is Domino's, with annual revenue of just over $14 billion. What we're wondering is, why doesn't the SCP Foundation want a slice of that lucrative pizza pie? After all, they're in possession of SCP-458, the never-ending pizza box. With the help of this bad boy, capable of producing nearly limitless quantities of pizza, they could surely start making a pretty pepperoni penny. Lego products are also a multi-billion dollar industry pointing towards a clear desire in the market for these charming, colorful blocks. And there's no LEGO like SCP-387, the living LEGO. Hardcore LEGO enthusiasts all over the world would pay through the nose to experience a product like this. And seeing as they're completely safe, in both SCP nomenclature and the more colloquial sense of the phrase, 
the foundation wouldn't need to worry about any lawsuits from concerned parents. They'd only need to worry about where to put all their fancy new stacks of cold hard cash. For those desiring a little escapism, the foundation could rent out SCP-1230, A Hero is Born. This book takes its readers on fabulous bespoke dream adventures through fantastical lands, and will surely give them an experience that will last long after they finally wake up. In a world where people are willing to pay top dollar for VR experiences and creepy Facebook metaverses, being able to enter the wondrous land of dreams is a welcome low-tech solution that would still likely make the SCP Foundation boatloads of new income. However, we live in a stressful world. Modern life has come with its wealth of new personal issues, from work troubles to the dating game. And connectivity has come at the cost of having an ever greater awareness of the troubles that plague the world at large. With costs making a lot of valuable therapy and medications unavailable to many, it's no wonder that we're undergoing a global mental health crisis. But the Foundation has a solution. SCP-999. Spend long enough time with him and he'll straight up cure everything from depression to PTSD. People all over the world would pay top dollar to achieve an immediate and effective cure to all mental maladies that only takes a few hours and has no negative side effects. Like the ultimate therapy dog, the foundation would be rolling in the dough from an opportunity like this. And of course, the most devious, ingenious, and overall effective method that the SCP Foundation could possibly use to make money is creating YouTube channels that pretend to just be sharing the fictional monsters and entities of a made-up online fiction project, when in fact, they're actually secretly leaking the highly classified secrets of their own organization, while selling adorable, high-quality merchandise of some of the most lovable and iconic creatures. We can't think of any method more valuable than that. Anyway, on a completely different note, did you know that you can get your very own adorable SCP-999 plushie pictured here looking cute as all heck? All you need to do is visit www.scpswag.com and you can have your very own Tickle Monster to hug anytime you please. And of course, if there are any other highly profitable anomalies you'd like to see in plush form, do take the time to make your suggestions heard down in the comments. Now if you'll excuse us, we need to head off. After all, time is money. You're a member of an elite mobile task force, tracking down an anomaly in a rural village somewhere in the Swiss Alps that was recently detected by SCP Foundation field agents. According to all the current intel, you're dealing with a particularly deadly and hard-to-contain monster, a shape-shifting entity that can kill with a touch and assume the form of anyone it kills. If this thing somehow escaped the village and broke into a major population center, it could blend in perfectly and cause death on a massive scale. It's up to you and your team to get this creature secured and contained before that can happen. You're going in heavily armed, with advanced sensory technology and several attack helicopters, each one loaded with plenty of powerful missiles. One way or another, you're putting a stop to this thing. But the best laid plans of mobile task force agents go often awry. The mission is a bloodbath. The shape-shifting anomaly has blended in perfectly with the innocent civilians living in the village. Before you know it, half of your team have been killed, and you don't know which of the remaining team members are really themselves. This really couldn't have gone worse, and if you mess this up, not only is your life at risk, but so are the lives of everyone this anomaly happens to get close to. All of your superiors were killed or transformed in the battle with the shapeshifter, and you're now sitting at the top of your MTF's chain of command. The way you see it, there's only one option. You radio up to air support, alerting the several attack choppers circling the village. You tell them to rain fire and destroy the whole place. That's the only way to be sure to take out the anomaly. Things have gone beyond the point of easy containment. You sprint past the village limits as the volley of missiles and firebombs raise the formerly quiet settlement to the ground. Other than the task force members in the helicopters, you're the only survivor. Over 320 people are dead. But on the upside, the remains of the shape-shifting anomaly were found amongst the rubble by Foundation personnel. You prevented whatever horrors it mm -hmm. would have caused if it had been allowed mm -hmm. to escape. Mission accomplished. But it's not over yet. When you solemnly return to the containment site you've been deployed from, your superiors order you to go pay a visit to Conference Room 2. You correctly assume that it's some kind of disciplinary meeting, maybe the site director chewing you out for shoddy work, but ultimately congratulating you for doing what needed to be done under pressure. After all, 
Making the tough decisions is what working for the SCP Foundation is all about. But when you arrive in the conference room, you're sitting across from a woman you've never seen before. She's tall with hard, stern-looking features and a plain but well-tailored suit. Despite being a hardened soldier on the Foundation payroll, something about this woman makes you nervous. She smiles and says, Hello, I'm with the Foundation Ethics Committee. We need to have a word. For reasons you don't quite understand, you start to break into a cold sweat. The Ethics Committee? I thought they just existed to scare Foundation employees. I didn't know they had actual authority. But that's where you made a terrible mistake. And from the tight smile on the agent's face, you can tell that the Foundation Ethics Committee has a lot more power than you've ever imagined. Perhaps you know them from the jokes that float around the Foundation circles. How many members of the Ethics Committee does it take to change a light bulb? None! The Ethics Committee can't change anything! Perhaps you heard about the O5 Council's disdain for them. Those bureaucratic pencil pushers with all their rubber stamps and red tape. The jokes don't seem so funny now, though. The Ethics Committee representative clears her throat and tells you that you've been reassigned, effective immediately. You're now under the employ of the Foundation Ethics Committee, and this change is non-negotiable. You try to state your case in blind panic. Part of you thinks that being reassigned to the Ethics Committee after the mistake you just made is code for being taken into a windowless room and shot in the back of your head. But the agent insists that really isn't the case. The Ethics Committee hates codes and euphemisms. They don't say terminated, they say killed. Because at the Ethics Committee, clarity of language is extremely important. They don't sanitize any horrific acts that need to be performed for the sake of containment. After all, it's their job to look these horrors in the face and give the final yes or no on whether they're carried out. As you may know, the SCP Foundation is essentially above all external law. No government, no organization, and no individual can tell them what to do. The 13 members of the O5 Council have almost unlimited knowledge at their disposal, as well as technology that the rest of the world could only ever dream of. With a setup like that, it would be easy to give in to corruption and go mad with power. If they wanted to, they could abandon their mission of protecting humanity from the shadows and instead rule the world with an iron fist. That's where the all-important role of the Foundation Ethics Committee comes in. As Uncle Ben once said, with great power comes great responsibility. Just as the O5 Council wields the power, the Ethics Committee wields the responsibility. They remind the whole organization that they are here to serve the world, not the other way around. Think of them as the conscience of the SCP Foundation. They decide what's morally acceptable for the Foundation to do in pursuit of its goals, to make sure that those who fight monsters don't become monsters themselves. As Nietzsche famously said, if you gaze long into an abyss, the abyss also gazes into you. Right now, you very much feel like you're staring into the abyss as the Ethics Committee representative calmly explains the situation to you. An important thing to remember about the Foundation is that it must be cold, not cruel. The second that the harm it causes is in excess of the positive results of the Foundation's actions, it's time for the Ethics Committee to step in and dole out some discipline. It is the Ethics Committee's job to balance the moral cost of every action performed by the Foundation, from the degree of collateral damage permissible in the field to the ways that D-classes can be ethically used in testing. While some hardcore Foundation loyalists may say that people like the Ethics Committee are standing in the way of true progress, giving yourself wholly to the mission without any ethical safeguards can be a dangerous line to walk. At that point, what's separating the Foundation from the Global Occult Coalition or the Chaos Insurgency? Or even worse, their nightmarish alternate selves from the universe of SCP-1730 and SCP-5000. While the Foundation occasionally needs to do some truly horrific things in order to secure, contain, and protect, it is the Ethics Committee that keeps them on the moral high ground. All of this seems pretty complicated to you, as you sit, still fearing for your life in conference room too. The Ethics Committee agent mm -hmm. explains that it's actually all quite simple once you get used to it. The Ethics Committee uses a moral framework known as utilitarianism. 
Think of it like the product of morality and math. Specifically, the committee uses an ethical system known as negative utilitarianism. This system revolves around the principle of harm reduction. The committee tries to modify every action taken to cause the least amount of possible suffering in a situation, the goal being to eliminate any unnecessary suffering from action. Take your decision, for example, the ethics committee representative says. Your actions, namely the destruction of the village, caused a great deal of suffering. However, considering the damage the anomaly could have caused after your team lost control of the situation, it's clear that your motivation was ultimately pure harm reduction. I admire that kind of thinking in a high-pressure situation. You feel a cool wave of relief wash over you. It feels safe to assume at this point that this probably isn't just a big front for your immediate termination. The agent sitting across from you seems to sense that that's what you're thinking and assures you that she's being nothing but honest with you. The ethics committee has no need to be petty. They know everything, after all. And that's not an exaggeration. Their clearance is basically the equivalent to level 5, the highest in the Foundation. Every line ever redacted from an SCP Foundation file, they were privy to. Every secret the Foundation has ever kept, they have absolute access to. And every decision the Foundation has ever made, the Ethics Committee has always had the final say, with veto power even over the O5 Council. And most importantly, all members of the Ethics Committee are former Foundation personnel, site directors, researchers, mobile task force operatives, all people whose decisions have caused pain and death. Much like jury duty, the responsibility is random and non-negotiable. What you're experiencing right now isn't a normal disciplinary hearing, it's an employee orientation. The cruel irony for a department of the Foundation devoted to ethical conduct is that it's actually complicit in pretty much all of the Foundation's worst moral crimes. After all, every action that the Foundation has ever performed has been performed with the permission and cooperation of the Ethics Committee. Take the infamous Procedure 110 Montauk, used to prevent the victims of SCP-231 giving birth. The Ethics Committee had a key role in designing the horrific procedure, and now they have to live with the soul-crushing knowledge of exactly what that procedure entails. And soon, you will too. Just one of the many perks of joining the committee. It isn't the easiest job, the representative tells you. She's got the steely blank eyes of someone who has seen some things that people were never meant to see. She continues, Before we conclude the first part of your orientation, I suppose I should tell you about the sowing circle. That'll give you a good idea of what you're in for. She tells you that the sowing circle was the anomaly discussed in the 2017 Ethics Committee Roundtable. It's an anomaly so secretive that it was never given an official containment number or classification, but it was proposed as a solution to one of the Foundation's most nightmarish problems, the shortage of human infants. It is an ugly truth about the Foundation that a decent number of anomalies, such as SCP-2845 the Deer, require the sacrifice of live children as part of their containment procedures. For years, the Foundation has been stealing children from orphanages for the use in these rituals, but the Sowing Circle could solve this problem. It was a mummified human corpse, wreathed in a circle of its own dried-out intestines. The mummy produced seeds which, if consumed, could allow human women to produce litters of 12 babies with an 8-hour gestation period, like the litters of a sow, hence the name. This would solve the baby shortage handily. It was the job of the Ethics Committee to decide what would be the most ethical way to use this anomaly. In the end, despite their own personal moral disgust at the actions, their philosophy of harm reduction led them to one conclusion. Using the device to impregnate already brain-dead patients effectively turning them into comatose infant factories whose only purpose was to be used in horrific containment procedures. But ultimately, the sacrifice would pale compared to the pain averted, seeing as millions, if not billions, would be under threat from some of these entities being released. Not that this makes the knowledge of what needs to be done any easier to handle on a personal level, but of course, after what you did at the village, you know this feeling all too well already. The pain and the guilt you felt at making that decision is going to follow you your whole life. And now, you're about to have countless more experiences piled on top. It's your burden, your duty, your job. The Ethics Committee agent forces a weak smile. She says, 
Of course, nobody said the job was easy, but somebody needs to do it. So, here's a statement that won't blow anyone's mind. The SCP Foundation is really, really, really weird. And we're not even talking about the actual anomalies they contain. Sure, this top-secret organization puts in the time and the effort to make sure menaces to society like the hard-to-destroy reptile, the Scarlet King, and even the horrifying bad joke tomato stay behind lock and key. But sometimes you need to hold the mirror up to yourself and see just what the heck is going on. I mean, seriously, think about it. This is an organization that uses live human beings farmed from death row as test subjects. Considering how rarely the death penalty is actually employed in the Western world these days, you know some shady strings are being pulled there. And what about the O5 Council, the leaders of humanity's last line of defense against anomalous chaos? And according to some accounts, they're a group of vain, petty, and morally bankrupt individuals who regularly use anomalies like SCP-006, the Fountain of Youth, for their own personal benefit. And don't even get me started on the actual scientists working under the Foundation's payroll. That's when things start getting even stranger. Of course, there's Dr. Jack Bright, a man forever changed by the chance interaction with SCP-963, an anomalous medallion, and one of Abel's deadly blades. Now he's an immortal weirdo who's mm -hmm. equal parts brilliant and a total nuisance, so much so that there's an entire dedicated list forbidding all of his zanier antics. Then there's Dr. Alto Clef, don't even try to shake his hand given how much this ex-GOC wildcard loves using violence to solve his problems. You may draw back a stump. He specializes in reality warping anomalies, often wields a ukulele cause he's just so darn quirky. Oh, and he's very likely the baby daddy to a teenage nature sprite after a dalliance with a goddess. Or, oh, and um, what about Dr. Charles Ogden Gears? Sure, he may not look that strange to the naked eye, He's a man so dull and humorous that gray is his favorite color, and he thinks sugar on cornflakes is an act of unacceptable decadence. But he's got a whole lot of strangeness under the hood. Like the fact he's such an emotionally unavailable father that his daughters across dimensions have formed a splinter cell of the serpent's hand, where they work under the collective pseudonym The Black Queen, just to spite him. Dr. Dan, through acts of sabotage, was personally responsible for the worst SCP-096 outbreak in Foundation history, leading to the end of thousands of lives, just so he could receive clearance to terminate the creature. And he got that clearance, on the condition that the SCP Foundation would be terminating him for his crimes as soon as the goal is achieved. And then there's... Oh my gosh! Did someone dress a dog up in scientist clothes? Oh my god, that's the cutest thing I've ever seen. Oh, this is just bright in my day. Okay, maybe I was being too harsh on the Foundation before. Who, whose dog is this? Excuse me, sir, that is extremely inappropriate. Wait, you can talk? Of course I can talk, you dolt! I'm Professor Kane Pathos Crow, one of the SCP Foundation's finest minds in the field of advanced robotics and biochemistry. I have a level 4 clearance for 343's sake. I'm not some common bloody mutt. Oh. My apologies, Professor Crow. I wasn't aware you were a, <clears throat> well, a talking dog. Well, yes, I imagine there's a lot you don't know about me, isn't there? Um, I'm a little embarrassed to admit it, but uh, that's true, Professor Crow. Our data on you and your work with the SCP Foundation is a little sparse. Here, take these files. These should give you a good primer. Okay, I suppose we better take this from the top then. Professor Kane Pathos Crow, among a lineup of extremely eccentric researchers, somehow manages to rise to the very top in terms of sheer strangeness. To get the most obvious fact out of the way, yes, while he was once a human, an anomalous experiment did result in him being turned into a Labrador Retriever. How did this happen, you may ask? We have the same question. Sadly, Professor Crow is incredibly reluctant to share any details about this strange and embarrassing incident, so we're just gonna have to accept it for what it is and move on. Everyone ready? Okay, good. Despite his strange appearance, Professor Crow is actually one of the more scientifically qualified of the Foundation researchers. It's no surprise that, because of this, he has a relatively close working relationship with Dr. Gears, so much so that he still refers to Gears by his early Foundation codename, Cog, a reference to both the legendary Stern Doctor's initials and a pun on his iconic surname. During one incident, Dr. Gears did tell Professor Crow to terminate an anomaly that was, for all intents and purposes, a human child, if it presented any difficulties. This sours the wholesomeness of that previous fact, so we'll swiftly move on. Once again, Dr. Gears is just terrible with kids. Like a lot of Foundation researchers, 
Professor Crow was personally headhunted by the SCP Foundation after his academic work in the fields of advanced robotics and biochemistry started turning heads. This was, just for clarity's sake, back before Professor Crow was turned into a Labrador. Mm -hmm. Professor Crow spends most of his time working in Bio Research Area 12, where he studies a variety of anomalies. But his bookish nature also earned him another interesting position. He's the SCP Foundation's chief librarian, where his encyclopedic knowledge of anomalous technical literature has made him a valuable asset in archiving and organization. Mm -hmm. This balances out some of Professor Crow's indiscretions. It is important to specify that Professor Crow is genuinely a well-liked figure among his SCP Foundation co-workers. After all, who wouldn't love to work with an adorable dog in a lab coat and glasses all day? But it's also important to note that he is also somewhat mistaken-prone, with a number of these mistakes putting him in the crosshairs of his superiors. Professor Crow has come close to outright termination several times, perhaps the most out of any prominent researcher currently working at the Foundation. However, to keep himself out of the same dead man walking category that the thoroughly unpleasant Dr. Dan currently finds himself in, Professor Crow has a few aces up his sleeve. Firstly, he's got friends in the administrative department willing to pull a few strings to keep him out of harm's way. Hey, maybe they're just very ardent dog lovers up there. The other thing that's kept him from being turned into an extremely overqualified chew toy for SCP-682 is the contents of his brilliant brain. On many of the occasions where the O5 Council have considered terminating him, he's demonstrated the fact he possesses vital and often irreplaceable knowledge, saving his furry skin. A perfect example of the kinds of strange scrapes that Professor Crow gets himself into is the incident in 2009, where, without even realizing it, he somehow traveled through time and scared the living daylights out of everyone. The details are best expressed here, in Professor Crow's own dictated notes. 1802-2009 In all my years working here, there have been few things which have irritated me. Caused me physical harm, yes. Caused me undue stress, yes. Caused me innumerable amount of mental distress, yes. But few things have just irritated me. Time travel is one of them. I went to bed on the 15th of January, year 2009, at 1.30 a.m. I woke up on February 18th at 9.26 a.m. of the same year. I hadn't moved, I had only nine hours of sleep, and to me, nothing had happened. Then, after a slightly confused day amidst the many cries of, I thought you were dead, among other things I might add, I discovered that I have been missing for the past month and three days. In that time, Sophia had completely taken over my duties, though she had halted all of my personal experiments and was trying her utmost to relocate me, while keeping my disappearance from the higher-ups. Apparently, data expunged, leaving me to sleep in a small self-contained bubble of data expunged, and making at least data expunged, which was eventually ruptured by data expunged, and sending me back to this phase of space and time. Needless to say, I was slightly irritated, to say the least. 2402-2009. Ah, they've had me in quarantine for nearly the past week observing me and running tests to see if they can find any sort of strange abnormalities with my physiology, my behavior, my anything. If I had one more hand shoved up my nether regions or I'm forced to look at one more bloody ink blot, I'm going to flip out and go rabid. They'll say they'll stop the quarantine soon, and Sophia says the higher-ups still haven't caught on to anything. And I suppose I'm lucky in that count. Normally, the only time they quarantine something is when it's too dead to be any sort of immediate security hazard. Still, I guess I can see where they're coming from. If it were my decision, I'd probably force a quarantine too, and probably for longer. At least they had the decency to give me my clothes, my PDA, and someone to dictate to. 1203 2009. I'm still here, and I hate it. Day in, day out, it's the same thing. Get up, eat, exercise, then simple observation until lunch, then more observation until dinner, then lights out. I'm not allowed anything other than the things I already have, and even then, I only got those because Sophia felt bad for me. I'm only allowed to use them every day for an hour at most. Otherwise, they're also in observational storage. All of this wasted time that I could have been doing something constructive, something useful, something interesting, but no. I'm stuck here because of a wry twist of fate forcing me into this monotonous hell. They keep telling me I'll be let out soon. Liars. 0505-2009. They've seen fit to release me. I almost thought I was going to die in there. Still, it almost seems strange to be out and about again, but I do appreciate being back in my own quarters, my own clothes and my beloved walker back by my side. 
Sophia has taken good care of the facility while I was gone. I think I might actually leave that to her while I keep to my experiments. She seems to enjoy it a great deal. Suits her analytical mind. <sighs> All of my personal experiments are still waiting for me. With the exception of the 040 test logs. They simply haven't posted their findings yet, stating that they needed my approval first. So I'll have to pour through those the first chance I get. I'm interested in the progress she may have made. Still, there is a good deal of work to be done, and I am more than ready enough to take it on. After all, I have to make up for lost time, don't I? It's clear that life isn't easy for poor Professor Crow. Much like Dr. Bright after experiencing the mysterious event that turned him into a dog, Professor Crow is both a researcher and an anomaly. And unlike the superficially subtle presentation of Dr. Bright's anomalous nature, it's hard to hide the strangeness of a talking dog in human clothes. This bizarre interstitial zone he occupies forces the Foundation to keep him on an extremely short leash. No pun intended. Seriously, Professor, it wasn't intended, I swear. Anyway, the point is Professor Crow isn't allowed to clock off at the end of the workday like his fellow researchers do. He's forced to remain on site, almost never appearing in public. If the professor wasn't the kind of person who could easily get lost in his work, a situation like this would probably drive him insane. Speaking of, you're probably wondering by this point, other than being the cutest researcher at the Foundation, sorry Dr. Clef, you're special in your own way, we promise. What kind of work is Professor Kane Pathos Crow actually known for around here? Professor Crow's most notable body of work is largely based on an opinion that's pretty controversial to hold around the SCP Foundation. He believes that they should be actively utilizing anomalies that aren't dangerous in order to further their collective goals. An excellent example of this is the cordial relationship he has with SCP-040, also known as Evolution's Child. She's a powerful reality warper who is able to synthesize new anomalous life from pre-existing living creatures. Professor Crow, who refers to her as Emma in his personal writings, was initially training her to do this with SCP-148, the infamous telekill alloy. However, he also filed a formal request to go further, saying, I think it's about time we started trying to utilize 040's abilities, or at the very least, allowing her to use them enough to actually learn how to control them. She will not be able to rely on the SCP-148 hairpieces forever. We theorize that as she gets older, her powers will increase exponentially, possibly to the point where her unconscious telepathy cannot be contained. He also somewhat infamously went ham with a series of experiments using SCP-158, a frightening anomalous device known as the Soul Extractor, which, contrary to its name, Professor Crow also realized could place removed souls into other objects or creatures. This led to the creation of a being that Crow dubbed Zero, because it was Subject Zero in his experiments to create a composite soul using SCP-158. He spoke of this subject, somewhat creepily, in his notes. Zero would make an excellent candidate for my assistant. It respects and admires me for its creation much as a child would an endearing father figure. I have assured it that it would be treated well, and that I would give it a host to the best of my ability to create. All that it asks of me is that it be given a name other than Zero. A name, not a number. I told it to give itself a name, to christen itself whatever it so wishes. It told me it would have to think about it. Like a lot of strange and fascinating figures, everything you learn about Professor Kane Pathos Crow seems to raise new questions. Is Crow just a mad scientist without a cause, eager to perform bizarre experiments for their own sake? Well, not quite. The sum total of all of Professor Crow's work is Project Olympia, a topic that probably deserves a whole video in its own right. And do sound off in the comments if you'd like to hear more about the deranged Frankenstein project that Professor Crow has devoted his life to. You see, Project Olympia is Crow's baby, and also his attempt to play God. Through combining a variety of different anomalies, including all the ones we've mentioned here, and several others, he would hope to create an entirely artificial living thing that would serve the interests of the SCP Foundation. How exactly this would be beneficial to the SCP Foundation is, admittedly, a little confusing. But seeing this goal through to its conclusion has become an all-consuming obsession for Professor Crow. He's performed countless experiments with a huge catalog of anomalies under the Project Olympia umbrella. He's written reams upon reams of notes and logs on the subject. 
and produced a huge number of prototypes. He's also used Project Olympia as a pretense to remove even more souls using SCP-158, because that just appears to be a strange obsession of his, doesn't it? Incidentally, we aren't the only ones confused about the exact purpose and value of Project Olympia. When members of the O5 Council finally got a proper look at Professor Crow's work with the project, they released the following statement. All activity related to Project Olympia has been discontinued. Overwatch Command has deemed it to be a gross waste of resources and permanently removed support for the project, with personnel assigned to work with it being moved to alternative sites. A hearing is to be held, with the project administrators to determine how the project was able to continue as long as it did, despite the lack of any concrete results. Prototypes and other equipment have been slated to be decommissioned. Professor Crow took this news about as well as you could expect, but in the end, he always finds a way to wriggle out and continue doing whatever he wants to do. Because that's what Professor Kane Pathos Crow is all about. He's living proof that sometimes, he just can't keep a good dog down. The SCP Foundation's mobile task forces are the best of the best. Their members are the elite, handpicked from the world's militaries, intelligence agencies, security contractors, and navies to create the Foundation's own security force. They ensure that the other personnel are able to do their jobs without having to worry about their own safety, whether it be during an assault on the site from the Chaos Insurgency or a containment breach from one of the countless dangerous anomalies that the Foundation contains. Of course, not every mobile task force can do everything. That's why each one is specialized. Highly trained and equipped with bleeding-edge technology and equipment, every mobile task force has one specialty, one thing they do better than anyone else in the world. And with the hundreds of mobile task forces on the Foundation's roster, that's quite a few specialties. There's the famous MTF Epsilon 11, the Nine-Tailed Foxes. Handling internal Foundation security, this military task force is made up of former Special Operations soldiers and are deployed into Foundation sites, usually when something has gone terribly wrong, to clean up the mess and restore order. Whenever a containment breach or communication blackout happens, Epsilon-11 won't be far behind. Or you can take the grizzled MTF Zeta-9, the Mole Rats. Specially trained to explore, map, contain, and if necessary, fight in enclosed subterranean spaces and anomalous topographies. Zeta-9 has a high casualty rate, but if they can't dive into the darkness to get the job done, nobody can. And who can forget the infamous MTF Omega-7 Pandora's Box? A secret task force organized in the 90s to train and utilize humanoid SCP objects in field operations for the Foundation. Some of the most famous humanoid anomalies, like SCP-076, were members of Omega-7, until it was forcibly disbanded by O5 Command, but that's a story for another day. But above all these task forces, one MTF operates on another level. The O5 Council, the group of 13 mysterious individuals that control the Foundation, retain one mobile task force for their personal use. Mobile Task Force Alpha-1, the Red Right Hand. Named for the biblical symbol of vengeance, Alpha-1 serves, appropriately, as the right hand of the Overseers, executing their edicts throughout the Foundation. Their operations are classified so intensely, one could be mistaken for thinking they don't even really exist. But Alpha-1 embody the will of the Overseers and are empowered to enforce that will by any means necessary. Most Foundation personnel will never even encounter Alpha-1 throughout their entire career, and if they do, it generally means that something has gone very, very awry. And for the few select personnel that get the opportunity to join MTF Alpha-1, they'll be put through rigorous physical, psychological, and anomalous screening before even being considered to have their identity and existence redacted from society and being pressed into service. But what exactly does MTF Alpha-1 do? How are their members selected? Today, we're going to look at the story of one such recruit to join the Foundation's most elite task force. D-0912, formerly known as One Andrew Carter, was unceremoniously forced out of his cell one morning and grabbed around the arms by the tall, imposing armored guards of the Foundation. The test subject was then made to walk down to the halls of the site, down an elevator, through several wings until they reached a door. Then from inside, he heard a voice. Step forward, D-0912. So he stepped through the threshold of the door, into the sterile, white testing chamber. Aside from a single metal chair in the middle of the room under one harsh white light, 
it was completely empty. The shadows made it hard to see the corners of the room. Behind him, a doctor who followed him into the room with a clipboard and lab coat wrote something down while speaking in a low, monotone voice. You will be vaccinated against an anomalous pathogen. Later, we will conduct tests of the vaccine's effectiveness. Sit in the chair. Before he even thought of running, the two guards flanked the door. Their faces were covered by black visors, and he could see his own reflection in them. Daydreaming to himself, he slowly moved toward the chair. He thought about gods and beasts and blood, how the Foundation seemed to suck up test subjects for its own purposes the way an old god sucked up sacrifices and left empty corpses behind. He heard footsteps. Sit in the chair, D0912. He was barely sat for a few seconds when the guard stepped forward and used the leather straps to tie his hands to the arms of the chair. Then he tried to think. Why was he here? Why was he in this jumpsuit? He couldn't remember. He had a faint memory of a crime being committed. Maybe murder, but who knew? Why did the Foundation care? He kept wondering about it more and more. He had no idea who was in his family or what his life had once been just that he'd committed a crime once. But if he was guilty of something, how the Foundation got in its hands on him? There aren't many death row prisoners in the world, and society keeps a close eye on them to make sure justice is served. Why would the Foundation pick the most closely monitored prisoners for their sacrifices? It doesn't make sense. What made even less sense was the Foundation entrusting the job to prisoners with little education and few specialized skills. Experiments require precision and finesse and manual labor could be handled using machines or drones for explanation. It seemed idiotic to have thugs and criminals do the work of unraveling the mysteries of the world. Just when D0912 started to wonder about how he even learned to think this while in jail, someone interrupted his reverie. D0912, the doctor in the lab coat said. He responded from the chair, you're, you're giving me a vaccination? That's right, the man said, not looking at D0912. Good day to give somebody a vaccination, isn't it? D0912 knew what happened to D classes on a monthly basis. He knew he wasn't being vaccinated for anything. Are, are you sure you can't make more use of me? Why would you throw away a tool for the greater good so easily? D0912 asked. I don't know what you're talking about, the man in the lab coat replied. But between the guards at the door, the restraints on the chair in the middle of the room, and the doctor's impassive face, D0912 knew he was being put to death. He wriggled his arms, pointing out that the straps were loose, but the doctor ignored him. D0912 couldn't figure out why he wasn't scared of his impending death, or why he was so nonchalant about it. Pieces of his mind seemed to be missing. His past had been ripped away from him, and his future turned in on itself. Try as he might, he couldn't remember anything about his life before his tenure in the Foundation's D-Class program. He decided that he might never have even been alive, and that's why he couldn't remember anything. Surprisingly, he also didn't hate the Foundation for killing him. The Foundation was a massive organization. It didn't hate him, it just needed him for a little while and didn't anymore. But the little people like the doctors and researchers and guards who made his life a living hell by poking and prodding and shoving and threatening him bothered him. These people were his only connection to other humans, and they were wasting his potential. D0912 started daydreaming again as the doctor in the lab coat worked. He imagined men chopping wood and carving stone to build a tower to reach the sky. Were the wood and stone being destroyed as they were stacked on one another, or were they always destined to be part of a tower? When finery and silk clothing was presented to an emperor, had the silkworms known their products would one day wind up on the most powerful man in the world? He was broken out of the reverie again by the doctor lifting up his sleeve, carrying a syringe in his other hand. The tip was long, thin, imperceptible, and impossibly sharp. Then it pricked into D0912's skin, and he began to shudder. It felt warm and hot and shook him inside, and flowed up into his brain. Everything turned white, and the room seemed to disintegrate into particles around him. But he noticed a presence overhead, draped in white clothes, and sensed the two guards looking at each other, exchanging a glance and nodding. He managed to get a few words out. St stop this. <sighs> oh God. Then he fell back into his mind, navigating out of the confusing, messy, dark maze inside his head. He couldn't see the light to the path, only smoking chemical fire until he was totally lost and heard screaming and roaring. As the beasts began to roar inside his head, D0912 remembered. He remembered his name. Andrew Carter, 
He remembered being told by a man in the lab coat that he had a unique opportunity to redeem himself. By participating in the SCP Foundation's D-Class Personnel Program for one month, you earn your freedom. For a second, he almost agreed to it, until his mind remembered. You're lying. I'm not a criminal. No, the man said. You're not. But I wasn't lying. You need redemption. D-0912 responded, I won't be told that I need redemption from people who detain, experiment on, and torture the innocent. You violated me. You made my own brain lie to itself. You had me pretend to be a criminal. The man laughed at him and pointed out the obvious. He had believed the lie. How can you say who you are when you can't even remember your own past? How does he even know his mind is his own? Why is it bad for the Foundation to mess with something Andrew Carter doesn't own? They argued for a few more minutes. Andrew insisted he was himself, and the man in the lab coat expected him to know his function, being a sacrifice for the Foundation's greater good. Then D-0912 asked who the man in the lab coat was, and the lab coat suddenly dissolved away. He realized he was hallucinating again, and had been hallucinating this entire time. The man's eyes turned into bright orange lanterns, and his chest cracked and peeled and writhed. This wasn't a man. This was a beast. The beast told him that if he did not know who he was, his sacrifice would be meaningless. That he would have to realize what he was before he could be redeemed. I will not be a sacrifice, D-0912 said. The beast laughed in his face, and a thousand voices laughed right alongside it. Then the scene changed, and he was somewhere else. Some kind of dirt road with a long metal chain link fence stretching across the horizon. Every so often there was a guard tower by the fence. He was standing in front of a gate, with the two guards from the room standing behind him. The electric fence's gate swung open to him, and the guards behind him spoke. The guard on the left commanded him to enter the gate, and he took a step and stopped. No, I've been here before. You made me do this, and then made me forget I did this already. The guard on the right just raised a gun to Andrew Carter's head. If you do not comply, we will shoot. Then shoot me already, D-0912 said. He knew that he had been here before already countless times, and the Foundation had amnesticized him over and over and over again. But this time, he remembered that his name was Andrew Carter, and they had spent too much time in the hallucination. Something was different this time around. As the echoes of a gunshot rang through the air, D-0912 collapsed to the ground. He saw through the gate to the village beyond. Numbers flew through the air and wrapped themselves around the villagers. They were marching, row by row, just as he had seen them do time and time again. He remembered feeling the numbers slide into his own brain. They had formed expressions and equations that blossomed into a billion different right and wrong evaluations as truth and falsehood were demoted to special cases of general chaos. He said the words then, My name is Andrew Carter. The words made a sign, and in all signs there was power, but the numbers and equations that proliferated in the air had power of their own. They formed rows and columns, and if D-0912 looked at them from far enough away, there was a sign written in the pattern of the numbers. He had seen this sign again and again, and the Foundation had made his mind forget it, again and again. So his mind went chasing after the sign and the source of the sign's power, until he eventually found it, wrapped it up in the branches of a wild apple tree, hidden where no human eyes had wandered. The hallucination was getting more intense, and he could feel his brain falling apart with the pressure. The guards walked over and knelt down by his sides. What do you see? One of them asked. As he laid on the ground, he tried to remember what he saw but couldn't describe it. It was like a power tool without someone holding it. It didn't know what it was or who made it, but it still knew its purpose. The other guard spoke, But if you have no marker, how do you know what your purpose is? Then something clicked in D-0912's tortured brain, where he was still navigating the forest maze in his mind. All the dark, confusing paths slowly merged together at the center of the maze, and he knew that the answer to the riddle was there in the center of his head between the beasts and the forests. It was his name, Andrew Carter. As he got closer to the answer, some things began to make more sense to his mind. There were two worlds, 
There was one world in which roads and buildings ran straight, and clouds drifted across the sky in set paths, and the earth rotated peacefully around a tranquil sun. There was another world where singularities and vacuums shattered the underpinnings of the universe, where fractal patterns spread out across the ground and radiated like halos from the unthinkable minds of human beings, and the roads diverged from one another in angles and spirals. It was the first world where the Foundation thought only about costs and benefits, and how to best maximize utility for seven billion people, and where no matter what, the Foundation was the greater good. He had lived his old life in the first world, and was only now seeing the second world for what it really was the truth. The Foundation had long since abandoned trying to describe itself to others, so there was no truth to what the Foundation was. It just was, and always would be. As he came to this conclusion, D0912 looked into himself in his hallucinatory state. He could see the chemical light substance that the doctor had injected into his bloodstream. The chemical reactions weren't what he was expecting. This chemical couldn't possibly kill him. In fact, it was a little similar to the chemical structure of the molecules of the amnestics he had been pumped with a dozen times before, but slightly different. He knew he was going to live. Outside of Andrew Carter's mind, the doctor was looking over his perfectly still body when one of the guards spoke again. Dr. Wainwright, said the guard on the right. Yes, sir, the doctor responded. Leave us now, the guard said. Yes, sir. The doctor lowered his eyes to look at the floor as he quickly shuffled out of the room. The guard on the left adjusted his visor to make direct eye contact with the guard on the right. Hey, he said, smiling. Look. He took out a syringe of red liquid from behind his back. The guard on the right responded. Do not implicate me in your misdemeanors, Adam. The guard with the syringe in hand snapped back. Don't blame me for trying to share. The guard on the right looked at him upset and said, You are to find site director and return that to him immediately. Petty theft from Foundation employees who know no better is rather distasteful. Furthermore, Halmas is a level 5 controlled substance. Its unregulated distribution is punishable. It's fine, Adam said, slipping the syringe into his pocket. I'll let the go-between know, and he'll tell the O5s. Jesus, Basson, do you really think I'd let the O5s lose track of some of their Halmas? In the chair in front of them, D0912's body convulsed. A low groan escaped his frothy lips. Immediately, the two guards moved forwards and removed his restraints. Andrew Carter, Bassam asked. Slowly, D0912 opened his eyes. Y you didn't kill me. We were not planning to do so, Bassam said. D0912 continued. You took me from the real world in order to make me into something. Direct, uncontrolled exposure to the Foundation's anomalies, re repeated anesthetization, leading me to believe that I would eventually be killed. Also, that my mind would be in the perfect position for the Foundation to change it with whatever is in that man's pocket. D0912 extended a finger at Adam, who offered a faint smile back. Already knowing things that you shouldn't know, aren't you, precious? Adam said. You have been altered, Bassam said, to meet the specifications of a top secret project. Over the course of your future, you will learn more about the Foundation than any of your previous jailers ever knew or could have hoped to guess at. You will join a group that is at the very head of the Foundation. For your entire life, this has been your purpose. D0912 felt the rotting flesh of the now dead disguise that had hidden Andrew Carter fall away. Bassam continued, Welcome to Mobile Task Force Alpha-1. In the SCP system, uncontained anomalies are considered especially heinous. At the SCP Foundation, the dedicated operatives who investigate and neutralize these deadly aberrations are members of elite specialized squads known as Mobile Task Forces. These are their stories. Dun dun. Hey, that was pretty good. Someone should make a TV show about this. But I digress. MTFs are a vital part of what keeps the SCP Foundation up and running, and keeps the public safe from all kinds of dangerous anomalies. MTFs specialize in a wide variety of different threats, and can be dispatched to handle those threats when ordinary field operatives just won't do. They might be a large army of militarized on-the-ground forces, or a tiny group of highly qualified researchers. It all depends on their specialty, and what sorts of threats the task force exists to handle. Either way, they represent the best of the best that the Foundation has to offer. If given the opportunity to join one of these oh-so-exclusive task forces, which would you choose and why? We pose this question to our loyal viewers here at SCP Explained and received as wide and varied a number of responses as the MTFs themselves. 
So without further ado, let's get into it and see who's suiting up for battle, brushing up on their thaumatology, or trying to crack down on that pesky Dr. Bright once and for all. Luna Hartnett said, Beta 7 Maz Hatters. The cleanup and containment of biohazardous anomalies sounds like grueling work, mentally and physically, but it also lines up pretty well with my real-world skill set. Listen, one of the most important parts of job hunting is knowing your strengths. If your strength lies with cleaning up all kinds of supernatural gunk, goo, and slime, then more power to you. Grab a department-issued super mop and get down to it. Thank you for your service. A clean foundation is an effective foundation. Iron Clamp said, Mew-13 Ghostbusters. Everyone knows how scary fighting the SCPs that you can actually see and physically deal with are, but imagine the steel balls it takes to go into a scene to deal with a potentially deadly SCP that you can't do either of those things with. It would be like having a much more violent version of Paranormal Activity or Insidious, but instead you have to figure out how to deal with it. Also, the idea of Ghostbusters but with guns is just too good for me to pass. Sounds like you're a horror fan, so enjoy your own personal entry into the Paranormal Activity Extended Universe, and try your best not to become a ghost yourself. Who are you gonna call? Januska A1 said, I would definitely want to be a member of Epsilon 11 Nine-Tailed Fox. The fact that they're only called in to deal with a facility and in such small teams proves that the skill set of these troops is astonishing. Not to mention they're under the command of Alpha-1 Red Right Hand, who are known as the best of the best. Also probing their skills in the game SCP Containment Breach, where three troops are sent into a facility where some of the most famous SCPs have breached, such as SCP-173, SCP-049, SCP-106, and many more. They easily sweep through the facility with no casualties. So in my opinion, Epsilon 11 would be my go-to task force. You've definitely got your work cut out for you if you want to become a member of Epsilon 11 and serve the red right hand. But if you can hold your own against the likes of the Sculpture, the Old Man, and the Plague Doctor, then go right ahead and try. I hope you've got quick reflexes, an itchy trigger finger, and can go hours without blinking. Rift Z said, I'd proudly wear the insignia of MTF Eta 10 See No Evil. I think visual cognito hazards is a really interesting thing to work with. Interesting, sure, and extremely dangerous too. Good job knowing what you want, and knowing that what you want is to risk exposure to all kinds of things that'll make it impossible to trust your own eyes. Don't worry. We've heard working with 8 of 10 is a lot like a game of Marco Polo. Only if you get it wrong, you break your brain, die, and unleash unspeakable destruction on countless innocent people. The drum major said, Definitely MTF Alpha 9 Last Hope. I've always loved the more human-friendly anomalies, and feel like even the most hostile sentient entities have some sort of kindness within them that can be shown if given time. Being able to work alongside these friendly entities to help people would be amazing. Oh, that's so sweet. So instead of just containing anomalies, you'd like to have them as your co-workers. It is a pretty impressive team you'd be joining. One that includes the likes of Iris Thompson, SCP-4051, also known as your friendly neighborhood Ketter, and the shadowy icon of crime fighting we call the Spectre. But there's no need to be intimidated. I'm sure you have your own strengths to bring to the table too. Maybe you always get everyone's coffee order right, or you're great at giving pep talks. Whatever it is, you'll be a great addition to the team. Lemon Demon Dengaropa, oh the name you have there, said, It would be interesting for me to be a part of MTF Omega 9, also known as the Scrubs. For context, they are a group of gamers who got trapped in a lobby of Quake and now help out the Foundation. While being stuck in a game would have some psychological consequences, it would be fun to 360 no-scope the competition and other SCPs who dare stand in my way. Why settle for being a Twitch streamer or a professional in the world of esports? when you could just leave your earthly life behind completely and spend the rest of your days in a world of pixels and non-stop action. You'll miss your friends and family, sure, but don't think too hard about that part. The rest of it sounds pretty poggers. Do people still say that? Don't tell me, I don't want to know. God, I'm cringe. The Raging Adam said, This isn't even a contest. I'd go with MTF Sigma 3, the bibliographers. Of course, not until after the whole library invasion thing had cooled off and they reorganized. 
It's just the closest you could get in the foundation to recreational anomalous usage, which is awesome. Who knows, maybe I'll sacrifice everything I hold dear to become a type blue. Smart move, waiting for the action to cool off first. If you end up becoming a type blue, let us know. I need a magic act for my nephew's birthday party, and he said last year's amazing Melvin pulling a rabbit out of a hat wasn't cool enough for his sixth grade friends. He's really hurtful. Mannequin Skywalker, okay that was funny, said, Honestly going to say, MTF Lambda 14, one star reviewers. I've got a lot of experience in retail, in many different positions. So I think I'd fit in there with being able to tell what seems anomalous or potentially how to deal with a retail-oriented SCP, including ugh, a Karen class. After working in retail, I'm sure you've seen horrors that would put the findings of the SCP Foundation to shame. After you've dealt with unruly customers picking a fight about coupons 20 minutes after closing time, there's nothing you can't handle. Tor the Jackal said, I'd go with Zeta-9 Mole Rats. I love enclosed spaces, especially those underground. If given the opportunity, I would definitely join Zeta-9. Are you sure you're not part mole? Groundhog, maybe. I've never met anyone who, quote, loves enclosed spaces, let alone <laughs> underground ones. But I also got kicked out of my local spelunking team for crying too much, so maybe that's just me. Sharky Reynolds said, I'd go for MTF Lambda 5 White Rabbits, and I would use my training to determine if the terrible new songs coming out these days are only popular through reality warping properties, or if the world is doomed to experience bad taste. It's probably anomalies. After all, everyone knows that bad music is a brand new invention, and every previous generation didn't think the exact same thing about the new music their kids were listening to. Hang on, I'm being told that's absolutely what happened, and that taste is subjective. Sounds fake. Besides, there's got to be a supernatural explanation for, what does the fox say? I won't hear otherwise. Banana1 said, Zeta-9 Mole Rats. I gotta respect this task force since they have the lowest survival rate when it comes to their missions. Besides, I like how their insignia was made with the design of a gas mask. We've got another volunteer for the Mole Rats. What is it with you guys and dangerous underground situations? It is a cool insignia, sure, but there's a reason it's a gas mask. You'll need to wear a gas mask. Good luck to you, I guess. Nick T. Wolf discusses, said, For me, it's kind of a tie between two groups. I would love to be on MTF Ada 11 Savage Beasts. I know I'm not 100% deaf and working on learning sign language. Being part of a group where I felt like I belonged and might be accepted would be a dream come true. If I couldn't get into there, MTF Sigma 3 bibliographers would be amazing. The idea of possibly spending time doing research and gathering info in the library would be a great experience. And in possible downtime, all of those books that are waiting to be read. That is a great reason. The Savage Beasts would be lucky to have you and you deserve to work with a team that understands and appreciates your unique strengths. Maybe you could split your time between the two and Moonlight as a bibliographer. Eternal Tribute said, I choose Tau 5 Samsara. I already feel basically emotionless, so it would have zero impact on me, and I like the idea of immortality and being a cyborg. I love technology. However, my alternative would be the debuggers or Skynet because I am decent with computers. Um, hey buddy, uh, you okay? I'm just checking. Fabian Roberts said, MTF Beta 777 Hectates Spear because I think it'd be interesting to look for knowledge about the occult rituals and how to stop them, especially in instances where an SCP was involved. Specializing in thaumaturgical ritual analysis, eh? It's the closest thing out here to joining a literal wizard army, so I can see the appeal. Just be careful. The world of thaumatology attracts the attention of forces you don't want putting a magical target on your back. Unlike the aforementioned Amazing Melvin, these guys are doing this stuff for real, and they'll do a lot worse than sawing you in half if you slip up on the job. Mr. Pixel said, I would probably want to be part of MTF Epsilon 9, the Fire Eaters. After all, who can say no to the alluring destructive power of fire? And it's not a war crime if I roast mostly anomalous creatures instead of humans. For the second time in this video, I say, are you okay, buddy? Maybe you should have a glass of water. You can't use it to roast your enemies alive, but 
it'll help you settle down. Nicotine said, Skynet, of course. The internet is a vast ocean containing both everything and nothing, thus giving me something to do for the rest of time, or at least until the world ends. Plus, what better excuse than being a member of Skynet would I have to watch you guys all day? Now you're talking. When you're not tracking sentient malware or the influence of the Archon Lord, you can spend your time watching more videos from SCP Explained. That's the perfect way to unwind after a long day of scouring the web for old gods and, I don't know, an iPhone app that knows when you're going to die. You're the web expert, not me. Hey, maybe you could teach me how to make a TikTok. That was cringe. Incidentally, we do have a TikTok now at SCP Explained Official. Go check it out after the video. Apple 3 3D said, Beta 7. I'm a biochemist in real life, so this would just go well with my skill sets. Working with anomalous biohazard cleanup sounds like grueling mental and physical work. I didn't know we had biochemists watching us, that's awesome. You're probably overqualified to clean up biohazardous anomalous material, but dress for the job you want. By which I mean you should probably wear a hazmat suit and some heavy-duty goggles. Who knows what kind of radioactive slime and monster snot you'll be wiping up. Jay the Monkey of Cherry Trees said, If I was asked to join any of the MTF teams, most likely after looking into them, it would be MTF Theta 4 the Gardeners. Seeing that many MTF teams usually follow certain protocols, Gardeners seems to be situated around very flora-based SCPs, usually in sites or locations of known flora-based SCPs, either mitigating the effects, securing, or researching potential sprouts of SCPs. Maybe some woodworker skills might come in handy helping the team, though I thoroughly wonder if the SCP Foundation would trust a man in an MTF team called Gardeners, who has a bonsai plum tree growing from their head. Oh, that's so nice. You must have a hell of a green thumb. Hold on. Wait, I'm sorry. What was that last part? Bonsai plum tree growing from your head? For the third and hopefully final time, are you okay? Blink twice if you're in danger. James Harold said, Definitely MTF Gamma 13, Asimov's Lawbringers. They're the group in charge of dealing with Anderson Robotics, who's the most interesting group outside of maybe the Church of the Broken God to me. Anderson Robotics has been a cybernetic thorn in the Foundation's side since 2007, with influence all throughout the Pacific Northwest of the United States, as well as branches in New Mexico, Arizona, and Louisiana. They're an elusive group, and while they're unlikely to attack the Foundation directly, their use of science and magic in one mysterious package is definitely something to keep an eye on. Fish Hissif, <laughs> I see what you did there, said, I'd have to go with Upsilon 23 art critics. I'm usually drawing or painting, so I'm down to get my hands dirty dealing with anomalous art. And I love slots. You like drawing and painting, so naturally you like to work with anomalous art. Hmm, makes sense. You might want to steer clear of any art depicting SCP-2774, though, if you want to continue loving sloths. That thing will ruin sloths for you faster than you can say, nowhere is safe in the corner of my eye, it's just staring, I don't know, I don't know. Charles Watson said, MTF-8-5 Jaeger Bombers. Sounds exactly like my dream job. Bombing runs in something like a C-130 is already something I'm interested in, and getting to fight what are essentially kaiju monsters makes it ten times better. Hell yeah, dude, I love to party. Oh, you said fighting. <laughs> Bombing runs? I grossly misunderstood what Ada-5 is responsible for. I'll just put this bottle of Jägermeister away and get back to work. Final Advance said, MTF Ada-11 Savage Beasts. I get triggered by even non-anomalous noises easily, so dealing with audio-based cognito hazards where noise discipline and actively shutting out sounds is perfect for me. If you hate sounds, I guess there's no better workplace than somewhere where you have to avoid hearing things at all costs. You'll be facing off against trumpets that can collapse walls, an anomalous chord progression, and even a corrupted Beatles song. So make sure you get some really good quality noise-canceling headphones, though, or you'll be in for a rude awakening. Alexander Berry said, Bright 99, oh no you don't, as a way to contain them more efficiently. I'd have them set up some form of comedic entertainment to be broadcasted throughout the Foundation to boost morale while keeping the Brights entertained. Of course, to be safe, we'll keep an eye on all items they have access to and run the broadcast through a filter to get rid of possible cognito hazards. Oh no you don't is right. 
If you're a regular viewer of this channel or a fan of the designated page on the SCP Wiki, you know that there are more things Dr. Bright is not allowed to do than there are things he is. It'll take some pretty good comedic entertainment to keep Bright occupied. I don't think you can just throw on SpongeBob or Coco Melon and call it a day. Dr. Bright is way too attracted to real life chaos to be distracted by television, though it's a nice enough idea. Or wait, are you suggesting we give Dr. Bright his own TV show? That is too much power. You cannot let him on the airwaves. He'll have half the foundation quacking like a duck and making the other half's head explode before you even change the channel. Sorry, your request to join Bright99 has been denied. Kurt Gamer said, I would proudly put the insignia of MTF Theta 90 on my shoulder, knowing that I have defended humanity, especially children, from the anomalous mathematics problems. I will even happily lay down my life to protect children from trauma, stress, and especially depression that anomalous math can do. I think math in its entirety is even anomalous. Let us rally together to ask the O5 Council to contain math entirely due to its anomalous ability to make anyone cry and be depressed. I hope my work can bring a smile to the children that I have defended. This brought a tear to my eye. Thank you, Kurt, for your willingness to fight against the scourge that is simple mathematics. With your hard work, children all over the world will never need to hear about Billy buying 30 watermelons and 22 apples ever again. I made it. I, I actually made it. I'm still alive. By some miracle or maybe by sheer luck. I made it to the end of my sentence. Over three months of the most horrific work I've ever had to do with no other alternative. But it's paid off. Because any minute now, they'll be coming into the dorm to let me go. I can walk out of here with my head up. I can't wait to get out of these orange overalls that I've had to live in since I arrived. It seems like so much longer in all honesty. The only way I've been able to keep track of how many days I've been stuck here is by putting tally marks on the wall next to my dormitory bed. One. Hundred. I've been a member of D-Class personnel for the SCP Foundation for the last 100 days. And here's how I survived. They didn't waste any time early on. I'll give the Foundation that. I'd barely been out of my sentencing hearing for a few days. Put on trial and convicted for a crime I didn't even commit. There had been a string of murders, and someone who had either been involved or was responsible laid the blame on me. But whoever they were, they had powerful friends. The cops were in on it, planting evidence to frame me and make me look like I was guilty when I was really innocent. That's what landed me in prison, serving a sentence of 25 years to life behind bars. And it was during my first week of incarceration that he showed up. The recruitment specialist, a clean-cut, blunt Agent Smith type, came to visit me. I hadn't even been in prison long enough to have visitor privileges, but the shady agent seemed to know which strings to pull in order to ask me an important question. What would you do to get out of here? he'd said. To which my answer was, anything. That was my first mistake. Immediately the next day I received a letter detailing more about what exactly Agent Smith was offering. It was folded and hidden in the spine of a book that a guard handed me during reading hour. Unfolding the message, it all felt like an old school covert spy tactic. To Mr. Emil Carker, the letter read, we understand that you've recently received a criminal conviction. There are two options currently before you, as detailed below. One, you can serve out the remainder of your sentence in prison. Or two, you can be released into the care of our organization. While with us, you will be helping to further scientific advancements through hard work. We have devised a system that allows convicts such as yourself to perform a vital role within our organization in a return for a reduction in their prison sentences. We have no interest in or intention of determining any guilt for the crimes for which you are currently convicted. We merely seek to present this opportunity for you. We ask that you destroy this letter once you have finished reading. Should you be interested in our offer, then please recite the phrase, it's a yes, to a prison guard with the badge number 47890. Naturally, as cryptic an offer like that was, I didn't need much time to mull it over. I was trapped in prison for something I didn't do, with no way to appeal for my freedom or prove my innocence. So, taking up a mysterious job opportunity from a shadowy group seemed like a much better alternative at the time. After all, I could either work off my sentence through employment, or rot away in a cell for the next two and a half decades at minimum. All I had to do next was find the right guard. I tried not to make it obvious that I was eyeing every prison guard's badge number as they stood around, keeping a close eye on me and the other inmates. But it was while I was out in the yard that I saw him, number 47890. I'd gone to bed with a knot in my stomach. 
Hours earlier, I had done exactly as the letter said and approached the guard, making sure I was close enough for him to hear me, but trying to make it clear that I wasn't looking to start any trouble either. I it's a yes, I told him. In response, 47890 had furrowed his brow and scrunched his mustache, seemingly in disgust. Back up, inmate, he commanded sharply. I backed away with my hands raised, confused as to what just happened. I spent the entire rest of the day thinking about it. Maybe the note had been a prank, some kind of initiation, seeing as I was the newest prisoner. But that didn't explain the agent who had shown up before. What was going on? The questions that were spinning around in my head eventually wore me out. And while I slept, that's when someone put a bag over my head, drugged me, and snuck me out of prison. When I woke up, I was somewhere new, a room filled with other convicts. Although, not many of them seemed to have come from the same prison I had been sentenced to. Plenty were sporting different jumpsuits, but their gruff demeanors told me all I needed about them. I was surrounded by a more violent breed of criminal, some of the worst of the absolute worst. The atmosphere in this pen full of murderers and monsters was so tense that it felt like the slightest accidental bump could explode into a full-blown fight. Suddenly, a hatch in the ceiling opened, and a pile of clothing came thumping down from above. It was a mass of orange, enough matching overalls for every inmate in the room. Of course, I held back from the initial clamor some of the others made, grabbing their new prison garb, snatching orange overalls from each other and arguing. When I eventually got mine, I noticed an unfamiliar logo emblazoned on the front of the uniform. After being made to wait a whole day in the pen, the other prisoners and I were filed out of the room by heavily armed security guards. We were all directed towards a hall. Nobody was daring enough to challenge the officers, even the more violent among the prisoners. I spotted that the guards' uniforms bore the same insignia as the overalls we'd been made to wear. It must have been the logo of the mysterious organization that had offered me employment. We were given an orientation talk led by someone who introduced themselves as a junior assistant researcher. They explained that our current location was highly classified, as was the true identity of the group that had arranged for us to be released. All we were told was that this was an unspecified form of research facility, and that we had to cooperate with the facility staff if we wanted to secure our release. It seemed straightforward enough, although the junior assistant researchers seemed to make a lot of jokes about us dying during these tests. I think they hoped it would alleviate some of the tension. It, it didn't. After sitting through the orientation talk, I still had more questions than answers. The one thing I had learned was that being tattooed hurt. Exiting the hall, the other prisoners and I had been directed to get a designation number tattooed on our wrist and across our chest. When someone had asked why the chest, the researcher conducting orientation had answered, Well, in the event of an explosion, it's most likely that it will be the largest intact chunk of meat left. This was another one of their jokes. Still feeling sore as my tattoo healed, I read the number now permanently inked onto my body. D2152. D-Class Personnel. That's what they call this now. We were directed into a dormitory, a lot less cramped than my old cell. But still, being surrounded by violent criminals when I knew I didn't belong there, it felt no less isolating. One of them, who took the bunk next to mine, introduced himself to me as Shiv, where he might try to kill me. I did my best to be friendly towards him. Shiv and I didn't exactly bond, but more sprung up conversations because there was little else to do. I was still worried about some of the flippant comments made about all of us dying, until he pointed out something far stranger. Don't you wonder why they're making us all wait? He asked. And the moment he mentioned it, I did start to wonder about that. It seemed odd that this organization had wasted little time in getting us all here. It had only been a week ago that I entered my prison cell for the first time, and now I was here. I think it's their way of telling us, Shiv went on, that we aren't here to be helpful, to be a workforce for them. They brought us all here to die. That comment made me look around and actually acknowledge the people I was trapped with. They were some of the worst criminals imaginable, irredeemable killers. Would this organization really let those people back out into the world after helping out with a few tests? I'd soon find out, because day eight was the last before I found myself working directly for the SCP Foundation. I picked up the name from a few places around the facility. Name tags, lab coats, and security uniforms, always with the same logo. Me and the other D-Class personnel were woken up early in the morning by a bell and issued with assignments. From the very first day the work started, I noticed that not all the others came back to the dorm at the end of the day. Shiv was one of those. My tasks mostly consisted of cleaning up with a mop, hosing down empty testing chambers that had a worrying amount of blood sprayed all over the walls and floors. The regiments were strict, and I made sure to do exactly what was asked of me to avoid causing any trouble. It felt like a lot like being back in prison, 
but with the only added caveat of being able to move around the facility, even if it was to go and wipe up the Foundation's mess. Although the other classes of personnel didn't seem to take kindly to my help, making snide comments as they passed me in the hallways. We'd been told not to address the other staff unless spoken to, which was frustrating. I certainly had a few things I would have liked to say to them. After two and a half weeks without so much as a hint of any trouble, I was given my first testing assignment that wasn't just cleaning up. You would think that would be exciting, but having seen some of the carnage left behind after other tests, I was anything but eager to take part. Luckily for me, and pretty surprisingly, my first test was pretty straightforward. I was shown to a room containing a white bowl decorated with light blue flowers that researchers referred to as SCP-348. I received a nasty splinter from my mop's handle the day before, and was instructed to sit down and eat from the bowl, which was filled with soup. Naturally, I eagerly ate it, despite how bitter it tasted. It was better than the food from the D-Class canteen, at least. But when I finished, I noticed a message had appeared at the bottom of SCP-348. It read, I don't believe you were framed. Goodbye, son. After that, it was as if the floodgates had been opened, and every day I was asked to do another test with a new SCP. Most were harmless anomalous creatures or objects, like one of the bigger experiments I was involved in, which focused on SCP-999, this friendly little gelatinous orange blob. Electrodes were hooked up to me while I just calmly sat in a room with SCP-999. Being around it made me feel great, the best I'd felt since arriving and joining D-Class. Although I did hear one of the other researchers making a comment that SCP-999 was, quote, not ready yet, whatever that meant. Even so, the Tickle Monster had given me a new positive outlook on my role at the Foundation. It was odd work, but I could find a rhythm to it that would hopefully make the time pass by a little quicker. And if it meant getting out, it was worth all the dirty looks from other classes of personnel. This was an outlook I didn't want to lose. After a month, we were told to take a pill that the guards handed out to us. Something called an amnestic that would make us all forget the previous month. But wanting to hang on to my newfound optimism, I secretly flushed mine down a toilet. In hindsight, I should have taken it. My next big test quickly brought me down a peg. I was handed a katana, SCP-572, and instantly felt like I was unstoppable. The sword made me believe I was a powerful warrior, and if I could maybe fight my way out of the Foundation facility with ease. Unfortunately, the moment I tried to use it didn't lead to freedom. I had an accident, broke my arm, and suffered a series of internal fractures, all while the research team mocked me. Embarrassed, I felt like a total laughingstock. Things only got worse from there. I'd barely set foot outside of the infirmary before a different team of personnel told me I was going to be assisting them with an important task. They dragged me to an old wooden door after briefly explaining what was going on, although I struggled to keep up. Beyond the door, which they called SCP-2317, was a vast salt plane. Following their instructions, I acted as an assistant to the rest of the team as they performed a strange ritual. I had to scatter a mix of holy water and chicken blood around a circle of seven stone pillars, then recite, Blood for the old gods, water for the new king. It was an unusual practice, to say the least, but apparently I was helping keep a powerful vengeful demigod imprisoned. That did little to soften the news that I heard when we returned through SCP-2317. When I was gone, one of the Foundation's security team had been infected by something known as SCP-2193, a phenomenon that makes people believe that every month a large group of D-Class are to be terminated. When I heard, I actually considered taking my amnestic for this month to forget just how many had been killed. It had been a whole two months since I had actively started work as part of D-Class personnel, and there weren't many of my fellow prisoners left. I was sent for a mandatory psychological evaluation. The Foundation wanted to know if I would still be able to perform tests for them. I doubted it came from a place of actual concern. It's not like they cared all that much if the things I had seen were taking a toll on me. Sitting across from a researcher performing my evaluation, I did my best impression of a normal person. I had to pretend like none of it was getting to me. All the horrors and the close brush I'd almost had with death by monthly termination, I wouldn't have lied about it normally, but I'd been told I had a month left before I was due to be released. Apparently not many D-Class made it that far, given the dangerous nature of testing. All I could think about was how good it would feel to eat real food again. I started to daydream about getting a cheeseburger on my first day out. Almost instantly, my hopes of freedom were dashed the very next day. I was told I'd be going on a longer assignment. This time it would be an expedition into an anomalous location called SCP-432. The Foundation researchers outfitted me with a flashlight, plus extra batteries. 
A headset and a microphone linked to their control center were placed over my ear, along with a camera unit mounted on my shoulder. They said it would wirelessly transmit back to them, and they'd see what I saw. I was also given a couple bottles of water, some energy bars, and a few sticks of luminous marker chalk. But when they had said anomalous location, the last thing I'd been expecting was to climb into a rusty metal cabinet. The next two weeks were like living inside a nightmare. Inside the cabinet was a huge maze, a literal labyrinth all made out of the same rusted steel of the exterior of SCP-432. It was so dark even with the use of my flashlight and the few light bulbs affixed to some of the walls within the cabinet maze. Before long, I ended up losing my bearings and lost with no way out. But being trapped in the maze and the dark wasn't even the worst part. There was something else in the labyrinth. Some kind of creature lurking through the metal corridors. My flashlight eventually ran out of power, so I never actually saw it, but every time I tried to sleep, I just lay awake listening to its growls. I couldn't help but think what kind of horrible thing was out there and might be looming over me in the dark. Even when I opened my eyes, I still wouldn't get to see it. Eventually, another D-Class was sent into SCP-432. By some miracle, he was able to not only find me, but guide me back to the entrance of the cabinet maze. The moment I was free, I yelled at the research team, demanding they let me go. I didn't just mean let out of SCP-432. I meant free from D-Class, from the Foundation, from all of it. I was sent for another psyche evaluation and deemed to be fine, just suffering from heightened stress. When they had asked me if I'd been taking my amnestics, I lied and I told them yes. Ten days before I was set to be released, and they couldn't help but assign me to one last test. Don't worry, a researcher sarcastically assured me. This one will be nice and easy on you. You just have to jump into a paddling pool. You can do that, can't you, D2152? The paddling pool in question was SCP-120. Every time a different glow emanated from it, I was instructed to jump into it. The exact second I did, I found myself transported somewhere new. I got the Himalayas on my first go, Greenland and the Sahara Desert on the next two tries. Every one of the locations I ended up at had some kind of foundation facility established nearby. They'd pick me up and I'd be taken right back to SCP-120 to continue testing. It felt like I was being deliberately, intentionally tortured. The Foundation was giving me these momentary glimpses of freedom every time I was transported by SCP-120. It was a carrot on the end of the stick that they were keeping just out of my reach and I hated it. It made me realize that I had never been there to work for them. Being part of D-Class personnel wasn't a job. All I was to them was a human lab rat. But now it's my last day. They promised me by the end of day today I wouldn't be here anymore. I just want to be out. Done with D-Class for good. The Foundation researchers have given me one last simple test to do before I go. They said if I do, then I'll be gone. All they wanted me to do is wear this amulet for someone named Dr. Bright. How hard can that be? And they said they let me go after this one thing, so can't be anything that bad, right? It's a tough job market out there right now. It feels like everyone is either being laid off, furloughed, stuck in a dead-end position at a job with no prospects of career advancement, or working multiple jobs just to meet the bills every month, as you're slowly driven into the ground. If only somewhere new was hiring, somewhere exciting, somewhere where every day is an adventure and you never truly know what you can expect. Well, lucky for you, there is such a place. It's the SCP Foundation, and after a recent high-casualty SCP-682 breach, they have plenty of new positions open for go-getters just like you. That's why we put out a post on our community page asking for the job at the SCP Foundation you think you'd be best at, and your reasons for why. And today, we're going to evaluate your answers and see who's up to the task. Let's go. Javier Gomez de los Santos said, I don't know if it counts, but being on the part of relocating safe SCPs that are rehabilitated, such as SCP-2273, would be a very wholesome experience to see them enjoy human company once more, other than doctors and security officers, and you could get some new extraordinary friendships such as Alexei Belitrov had with his psychiatrist. We thought we'd start this video off on a nice, wholesome one. In any kind of broken veil scenario, it's natural that some of the nicer anomalies like Bellatrov, the reluctant dimension hopper, and the abdominable planet guy would be released back into civilian life. Of course, to get a job helping this happen, much like Alexei Bellatrov's psychiatrist, you'd likely need to be qualified in social work, psychology, or psychiatry, but it's probably one of the more fulfilling jobs you can get with the Foundation. Geology Hill 123 said, 
Having an MA in history, I can see myself working as a researcher into ancient anomalies and finding their cultural origins. Plotting the aristocrat's family tree, altogether knowing the Habsburg's lineage is more of a shrub, would be fascinating. The Wanderer's Library sounds like a dream come true as well. Ah, uh, now this is a fun one. Seeing as anomalies can manifest in everything from ancient ruins like SCP-2621 to extinct cultures like the Davites to twisted family lines like the aristocrats, taking a historical approach to exploring SCPs is definitely a valuable job, and one perfectly suited to people with a background in history. Just be careful with some of those ancient texts. Reading the wrong ones might lead to certain strange mental and physical changes. Suicune fan123, I think that's how you say it, said, I'd love to work in virology within the foundation, specifically writing the reports for the more math-minded folks in the field. In my experience, they need the help. Ensuring reports are clear, concise, and useful would be my ideal placement. Dream job in reality, too. Virology is an undeniably useful skill for work at the SCP Foundation, given the number of terrifying viruses they deal with, like the incurable contagious zombie virus SCP-008, the sarcic nightmare that is SCP-610 The Flesh That Hates, or the considerably more technological infection SCP-217 The Clockwork Virus. And hey, somebody needs to write those reports. Drew Sklar said, As an engineer, I feel like doing researching and development for containment procedures would be so interesting. The conditions a cell has to meet vary so much between SCPs, and each one is so strange and interesting that it feels like a puzzle. Containment specialists are a vital part of the operations of the SCP Foundation, considering that containment is one of their core principles. It's an exciting and intellectually stimulating job, but there's also a lot of pressure involved. Knowing if you don't do your job right, you could be responsible for a breach that leads to a huge number of deaths for your fellow personnel, the civilian world, and potentially even you. We're sure you'll do fine, though. No need to stress. Selifon said, Personally, I'd want to work in amnestics. You don't have to interact with dangerous anomalies, just your fellow Foundation co-workers. I doubt the job is anywhere near as insane as research staff or MTF. Being a Foundation middle woman suits me just fine. In with the Class AB amnestic and out with the Cognito hazard, my friends. That is a great attitude. And honestly, there are a lot of benefits to working directly with amnestics. Fun fact, every time that we have a video that underperforms, we release an amnestic gas onto our audience and release it again later. Who knows how many times you've listened to this sentence that you're listening to right now. <laughs> Moving on. Tim West said, I would go with where my experience helps me excel at the most. I've been working as a PSO, Protective Service Officer, for the Department of Homeland Security for some years now. I also worked as an armed bouncer, was trained in the use of force, defensive tactics, trained with firearms, long guns, and unarmed combat. Also trained for bomb detection and use of magnetometers. For the SCP Foundation, I would apply for the Security Division. Well, Tim, you seem pretty much perfectly qualified for the job. When can you start? No, seriously, can you start right now? SCP-106 just got out again and we really need a hand getting him back under control. Yeah, it's an all-hands-on-deck situation. Oh no, he's coming through the wall. Oh god! Grand Admiral Batch said, I'd go for Containment Specialist, Occult Selection, as I am very well-versed in the occult. As to where I'd exceed others, probably when it comes to rituals, as I have an interest in them and know a lot about them, including some, let's say, practical experience. Huh. Are we allowed to ask follow-up questions? Because I'm now really, really curious about your occult experience, Grand Admiral Batch. We'll dispatch a field agent shortly. Meta Man said, I don't really know much about the rankings or positions in the Foundation, but if there was a job for deciding who or what gets sent to where for testing, I would do that. I could do cross-testing as well as just having the ability to have my worst enemies killed by an SCP. Okay, see, applications like this are why we do background checks, Meta Man. You need to ascend to the level of O5 Council before you can start using anomalies to belligerently assassinate your enemies without consequences. Doing it on any level below that is more likely to get you into some serious trouble with your site director. Missing No said, I'm proficient with firearms, and I've been refurbishing weapons and doing some pretty decent gunsmithing for parts that I need or need fixed up for the past 10 years. I'd have an undying loyalty to the Foundation, and maybe have a chance to work with some of that fancy anomalous weaponry, or just a hired MTF guard. The first would be fun. Or I could just be Dr. Bright's newest body, or fodder for 682. Whatever works. Well, we appreciate the fact that you're giving yourself a wide range of options here, especially considering that being a vessel for Dr. Bright or fodder for SCP-682 has a very low barrier to entry. 
But hey, considering that MTF operatives are often killed in the line of duty, it's likely that a position will open up for you if you can prove yourself. Ellis Bellis 13 said, I think I would be a researcher trying to understand anomalies who seemingly break the laws of physics and the universe. I am studying math and physics and currently doing my bachelor's thesis on quantum bits. By understanding the physics allowing the anomalies to behave anomalously, we could utilize the knowledge to develop new cool technologies. We like your style, Ellis. We need people like you on the team. Just make sure that while developing this new physics bending technology, you don't wind up trapping yourself in the red reality. But hey, at least you'll be able to keep Dr. Scranton company. Eric Back said, I'd love to work with the technical side of the whole foundation. Could be anything from IT to constructing the containments used on SCPs. Yes, please. You could act as a replacement for Technical Director Rosen. Seriously, he's utterly unbearable. We need to get rid of that jerk. Krizia said, would probably be an MTF Mu-13 Ghostbusters. I've always been fascinated with the supernatural. That and my sensitivity to the paranormal and seemingly paranormal would definitely make me a valuable asset to the team. You seem like a great fit for the team. We just hope that ghostbusting makes you feel good. Psycho Cobra Gaming said, Having a background in psychiatry, I immediately go to the idea that all of the stress and threat of constant death would really weigh on the mind of the employees. I'm not sure if the Foundation has a psychiatric department, but if I could spearhead the creation of one, then I would be given the room to climb up the hierarchy of the Foundation. I'm sure Dr. Bright must have PTSD from his several deaths and the O5 Council must have some form of mental anguish from their centuries of life. Oh yeah, we imagine it indicate that something is very wrong if a seasoned Foundation employee doesn't have a little PTSD on the books. The scary thing is, with some of the poor folks at the SCP Foundation, them recounting their days might give their therapists PTSD. Stonewood Studios said, Some kind of mechanical engineering profession. Just being able to observe anomalous tech would be incredible. I'd love to try to discern how 914 works, or spend my days trying to understand the functionality of the numerous remnants of the broken god. This seems like a good application of your interests and skills. And if you want to be even better at engineering, why not put yourself into the SCP-914 chamber and set it to very fine? Just to see what happens, you know? It's a fun time. Frank Official said, Honestly, even just being a janitor would satisfy me. There's this sense of dread knowing some sort of dangerous thing could break out at any moment. It really does get your blood pumping. It's a bold choice, honestly. All the danger and stress of working for the SCP Foundation without any of the clearance, pay, or prestige. You're playing 5D chess. Minty said, I'd like to be part of some kind of Foundation reintegration program where the SCPs are taught to control their powers and just get used to being less deadly so they could re-enter human society. I just feel bad for the SCPs being essentially put in cages. Some of them need a hug. Barring that, I just sign up for the Serpent's Hand. Considering that the SCP Foundation can be a little cold towards anomalies, you may eventually find yourself becoming disheartened towards the Foundation and its practices. At this point, yes, it seems likely that an allegiance with the Serpent's Hand would be a pretty appealing prospect for you. Cat and Otter said, I would enjoy some good old low-risk humanoids. Have a nice chat with them. Maybe a round of tennis with Kane, Iris, and Mr. Fish. It would indeed be nice to chat with some low-risk humanoids. Be warned about Mr. Fish, though. He's been known to be a little salty on occasion. God, that joke was bad. Pikeshade said, I suppose I would like to work as an archivist in a records room cataloging anomalies and updating files. I do that mostly in my IRL job, while also turning old Word document manuals into educational videos. So I could probably also collaborate with doctors and researchers in how to make training videos for new D-classes and MTFs and how to deal and approach certain SCPs and or rival organizations. Wait, you want to make training and informational videos about SCPs? That sounds to us like you want to be our competition. Listen, buddy, we rule the fun, user-friendly, infographic videos about SCPs game. You don't want to step on our turf. We can be very aggressive. Gabby said, I think I would work in the application and development of containment, which would be less stressful for the SCP. My hope would be to make more of the sapient SCPs comfortable, hopefully befriend a few. I would more than likely die within the first week, but I hope at least I'd make someone or something smile. The SCP Foundation honestly needs more people with a humanist approach like you. There are plenty of perfectly friendly sapient anomalies who deserve to have a nice, comfortable pad while they're contained by the SCP Foundation. Do we really want God complaining about scoliosis because of his unpleasant Foundation cot doesn't have enough padding? Just make sure you exercise caution when selecting the anomalies you decide to give the fancy new digs to. 
seeing some of them might use it as a method of escape. That being said, if we gave SCP-106 or SCP-049 a high-quality jacuzzi in each of their cells, do you think they might chill out a little? After all, we've never really tried making the containment chamber too relaxing and chill to even want to leave. Symphony in Blue said, I think it would be cool if there was a position where you just visited chilled with some of the friendly SCPs, especially those who struggle with living in containment. I feel like it would be really helpful for them and their general well-being and mental health if they had someone who wasn't explicitly a researcher or a doctor, but was rather just somebody to talk to, to chill out with, and to give them a little bit more normality. Might help people be a little more comfortable and happy in containment. Again, this is another pleasingly wholesome one. A lot of these anomalies could use a friend to chat with. Dr. Gears isn't the most scintillating conversationalist. LolChief119 said, I'd probably enlist in MTF Beta 7, the Maz Hatters, because there was always this deep fascination about biohazard, chemical, and radiological stuff that I've had for many years now. Plus, there was a great chance I get to kill zombies. Maybe if I ask the task force leader really nicely, maybe I can carry a barbed wire bat when clubbing said zombies. While deciding to club anomalous zombies to death with a Negan-style barbed wire bat would definitely earn you some points with other weird violent mavericks like Dr. Clef. In all likelihood, though, you'd be spending most of the time in a heavy-duty hazmat suit, picking up dangerous waste material in the aftermath of an anomalous attack. Have fun! Chocolate Quill said, I'm gonna be completely real with y'all. I'd like to think I'd be a high-level researcher for the Foundation, but I'd probably get demoted for wanting to play with SCP-999 all the time. We appreciate your honesty, and there are definitely worse things you can get into trouble for doing at a Foundation containment site. Like that one brony researcher who, um... <clears throat> Well, you, you know the story on that one. Brody Inch said, Well, I'm not gonna lie, I feel like I and SCP-049 have a lot in common. Not the fact that we are both doctors or kind of evil, but that we share a personality and a lot of mannerisms. If there was a job to study and interact with a single subject, that's right for me. I also think it would be pleasurable to learn from SCP-049 as we share a lot of mannerisms. There's a chance I could possibly become a friend of sorts and he could tell me all about how his bag works along with the language he writes in. Hey, that sounds excellent. We think SCP-049 would be elated to have a new friend to discuss his thoughts and theories with. And having someone he sees as a peer would be a great way to keep him mellow and stop him from breaching containment all the time. Maybe we found the solution to one of our oldest... Oh, okay. Back to the drawing board, I guess. Imain Abba said, Personally, I would like to be part of the Ethics Committee. They're probably the most powerful group in the SCP Foundation besides the O5 Council. I'd be able to access knowledge that most of the staff can't. The most important part for me is that I'll be able to make the experiments on the SCPs and the D-Class less violent. They deserve some rights as well. Wow, we are really learning that a lot of our fans are surprisingly ethical people today. It truly warms our SCP-058s. And it's true. The Foundation really does need the Ethics Committee to make sure that these monster hunters never become monsters themselves. Angel Jaff Benitez said, I'd love to work with anomalous plants, either in the bio-research zone or as a member of the gardeners. I just like plants that much, even though I know what some plants are capable of. Hey, the Foundation needs plenty of botanists for their wide variety of plant-based anomalies. And if you like your plants to have a little bit of flesh on the side, you can head down to SCP-3989, The Bone Orchard, for the best of both worlds. Thorn Wolfie said, I'm an animal caretaker with a bachelor's in zoology, so I'd likely be some kind of cryptid keeper. I'd do my best to ensure the more beast-like SCPs were as comfortable as possible in their enclosure, while maintaining security and their safety as well as the rest of the staff. I'd likely also advocate a bit for them, try to keep too many inhuman experiments from happening. No cruelty for cruelty's sake. Cryptid Keeper is a hell of a job title, as long as you remember to stay safe out there. After all, some anomalies are more dangerous than others, and it's often rarely the ones you think. But we definitely respect your commitment to keeping things humane. It's always the best way to go. Wow, what an incredible interview session. It's looking like the SCP Foundation is going to have an awesome new stock of employees on their hands once all that paperwork is through. And thanks to this organization's incredibly high turnaround, we're sure that once all of these newbies are either nicely grizzled or killed by an anomaly, we'll get some new fresh faces around here real soon. Mobile Task Forces, the renowned first line of defense for the SCP Foundation. Comprised of the organization's most highly trained operatives, MTFs are the boots on the ground, dealing with anomalous threats and containment breaches head on. It's a dangerous job. In fact, joining an MTF is widely considered one of the most hazardous roles within the entire Foundation. 
one where every day brings with it a whole host of unexpected threats and a high number of casualties. So let's take a look at how one of those days goes. 6 a.m. Rise and shine, troops! Comes a gravel voice yell louder than any alarm clock. The very second that early morning call goes out over the intercom, the members of MTF New 7 are on their feet. Climbing out of their bunks and quickly getting into uniform, the operators file out of their barracks and hastily make their way to the mess hall. Among them is the latest recruit to join this particular task force. Private Killian Hess lines up to receive his breakfast behind his new squad mates. This all takes place before most of the Foundation has even woken up. Even though these MTF operatives would rely on working as a team to keep each other alive, there is little casual conversation. Most of them are actually quite solemn as they eat, aware of the inherent risk that comes with their job. Private Hess, receiving a briefing the previous day, is paired with a more grizzled and much older veteran of New 7, Lieutenant Patterson. Upon sitting next to his new senior officer, Hess immediately asks what has the rest of the unit feeling so down. Boy, you really are new, Patterson scoffs. Look, rookie, we do what we do and watch each other's backs like good soldiers. But make no mistake, you're on the USS Enterprise now, kid. And we're the red shirts. 8 a.m. Following their breakfast and early start, any MTF operatives that aren't thrust into immediate action are sent to their designated basic training area. Here they are presented with all manner of intense assault courses, fighting rings for hand-to-hand -hand sparring, and a live ammo shooting range to improve skills with weapon proficiency. The SCP Foundation demands the highest level of skill from its mobile task forces, so regular combat drills are an absolute necessity for keeping their operators alert and ready to take on all manner of threats. For some of the more hot-headed MTF troops, drills are a chance to cut loose, show off their skills, or challenge their squad mates to beat each other's fastest assault course times, or shooting range scores. But to those that have been around longer and have the benefit of hindsight after multiple catastrophic containment breaches, morning training can feel like pretty inadequate preparation. After all, the Foundation sends its MTFs to take on some of their most dangerous SCPs, most of which have wild, unpredictable abilities. How does practicing Krav Maga really help prepare someone for a fight with a creature that can warp reality around it? And hitting motionless paper targets at a range can seem a little redundant when some anomalies are virtually bulletproof. 10 AM Of course, this is the SCP Foundation, meaning it doesn't take long for some strange happening to occur. MTF New 7 are soon dispatched on their first assignment, after the Foundation loses contact with a site known to house a particularly dangerous anomaly. Nicknamed Hammerdown, the task force Hess has found himself thrust into is usually deployed as a direct result of incidents where communication is lost with Foundation facilities, and containment breaches are suspected to have occurred. Hopping aboard a high-speed transport, Private Hess and the rest of Hammerdown are quickly briefed on their mission. At approximately 0900 hours the same day, the Foundation lost contact with another pair of their MTFs, Omega-59 aka Nechieva's Wolves and Sigma-18, the Chess Masters. Both were stationed at Armed Containment Complex 04, a secure location within the Russian Federation's Sakha Republic. Patterson informs the rest of MTF News 7 that they were to re-establish communication with the site and assess any potential danger. Although by the time the transport arrives at Complex 04, it becomes pretty clear that things aren't looking good. SCP-1984 has breached containment. The dead hand is loose. Unluckily for Hammerdown, SCP-1984 is a semi-corporeal entity with the nasty habit of attacking any human being that it comes into contact with by disrupting their nervous systems, usually resulting in excruciating pain. Although, that did answer the question of what had happened to the other MTFs at the site. 12 p.m. Immediately engaging the dead hand, Hammerdown stormed Complex 04. Patterson had ordered them to go weapons hot on the creature from the moment the transport touched down. Having manifested as a hazy humanoid outline, SCP-1984 was making quick work of slaughtering MTF Omega-59 and Sigma-18. New 7 were able to intercept before it could completely decimate their fellow operatives, but now the Dead Hand had them pinned, stopping the unit from accessing the on-site armory. While they had all arrived loaded for bear, 
The MTF operatives knew they couldn't keep SCP-1984 at bay for long with only their standard-issue conventional weapons. The entity's only known weakness was microwave radiation that could be emitted using specialized weapons, if only they could access the Complex-04 armory. Time is of the essence, too, and the pressure of stopping SCP-1984 quickly weighs heavily on Private Hess. He and the rest of Hammerdown know how the entity operates, that it would be heading just over 80 kilometers northwest at the first chance it got. If one too many of them were killed, or if there was a pause in the fighting for a second too long, the Dead Hand would be on its way to an installation nearby housing a number of intercontinental ballistic missiles. Once there, it would waste no time interfacing with nuclear command systems, launching those ICBMs, and causing catastrophic destruction. 1.30 p.m. Deploying some quick thinking, Lieutenant Patterson contacted Foundation Command and had them send a secondary detachment of New 7 to the missile installation. Part of their mobile task force includes a platoon of experts in various forms of warfare, not just chemical and biological, but nuclear, too. While that portion of Hammerdown were directed to lock down the missile installation 80 kilometers away, Patterson, Hess, and the rest of New 7 were trying to distract SCP-1984. Their engagement lasted around an hour, with the entity attacking a number of the troops on the ground. Each one would suffer symptoms of intense neurological trauma, including seizures and the loss of cerebral spinal fluid from their nose and eyes. Experiencing it was painful enough, and the sight of his fellow MTF agents dying in such a horrific fashion wasn't exactly what Private Hess expected from his first day. Eventually, SCP-1984 dissipates after a sustained battle with Hammerdown although it could easily re-manifest if it ever intercepts particular broadcasts. But the task force's work at Complex 04 is far from over. After the battle comes the cleanup operation. Private Hess follows orders from Patterson to clear as much debris and as many bodies as he can, making a note of every member of their unit that they lost to the Dead Hand. However, it doesn't take long for the surviving members of New 7 to receive another call for assistance. 4 p.m. Despite Hess's concerns that he and the others haven't eaten in hours, the team loads up and heads out again. The Foundation has sent word that someone has taken advantage of all the commotion at Complex 04 and forced their way into a different site. Wasting no time, the remainder of Hammerdown dusted off from the Saka Republic, locking and loading, ready to begin their next mission. Arriving at the site, Foundation Command radios to New 7, updating them about their situation. A large group of assailants, all members of the Church of the Broken God, was midway through launching an assault against the SCP Foundation. Their goal was unclear, although the site they had targeted was known to house SCP-882. This anomaly is widely believed to be the heart of the Broken God, a deity worshipped by those of the Mechanist faith. One of the Church's core goals was to repair their god, as well as to enhance themselves through mechanical, anomalous means. Of course, this means that a group of cyborg cultists awaited the arriving task force. Hammerdown clashes with the Church of the Broken God, trying to divert them away from the saltwater tank containing SCP-882. Lieutenant Patterson warns them not to get too close to the mass of welded metal, noting that the MTF's troops' weapons would become fused to SCP-882 if so. Hearing that is what gives Hess the idea to engage the cyborgs hand to hand. Although the church members were much stronger, Luring them closer to the heart of the Broken God meant all their metallic enhancements would also become pulled into SCP-882, killing the devoted cultists, despite how pleased they were to become one with their god, Mekane. 7 p.m. Moments of levity are often rare for mobile task forces. Already it's been a hell of a day, multiple deployments and extremely high casualties. For Private Hess, exhaustion is already setting in. He's been awake for over 12 hours, barely survived encounters with a hostile SCP and a tenacious group of interest. And during each of the ensuing battles, he has been made to watch as a number of his fellow operatives die, some of them he'd only just met. Now he can barely recall their names. Instead, as the day draws to a close, he prays that he, Lieutenant Patterson, and the dwindling remains of their squad won't be called on again. But this is the SCP Foundation, after all. 8 p.m. And whatever can go wrong, usually does. With a gigantic, angry reptile in the middle of it. Sure enough, the alarms begin to sound, and Private Hess has to get back to his feet. He musters what fading scraps of energy he can will back into his being, his weapon feeling heavier than it has all day. 
A tiny spike of adrenaline hits as Patterson barks the fateful words Hess had hoped he would never hear. On your feet, soldier! SCP-682 is loose. Hammerdown races through the facility corridors, passed by a flood of researchers all fleeing for their lives. The MTF team reaches the containment chamber, just in time to witness SCP-682, the infamous hard-to-destroy reptile, lunging at the unfortunate personnel that couldn't get away in time. Right next to Hess, one of his fellow New 7 teammates steps in a puddle of acid that is spilled from the vat that usually houses the murderous reptilian monster. As the carnivorous SCP-682 finishes decimating its previous target, it turns to angrily charge for the MTF troops, who raise their weapons and open fire in what is ultimately a futile attempt at stopping a creature that can't be harmed by mere bullets. 10 p.m. Hours pass. Containment breaches by SCP-682 are far from an uncommon occurrence, and fortunately, the Foundation's task forces are more than used to driving the creature back into its acid tank, where it's held only slightly more securely. But with every escape attempt by the hard-to-destroy reptile comes a slew of casualties from Foundation personnel, and today is no exception. Despite having sustained heavy injuries himself, Lieutenant Patterson is instructed by his superiors to file an end-of-day report before he, and those that are still breathing, can be debriefed. The MTF lieutenant tallies up the considerable losses his unit sustained on their various engagements throughout the day. Every operative killed by the dead hand, then those that the Church of the Broken God were able to make quick work of, and, of course, the ones who met their demise at the hands, or rather, jaws, of SCP-682. The role of a mobile task force operative is a difficult and dangerous job, but what few realize is how expendable these troops are to the Foundation. In fact, they're not all that different from D-Class in that regard. The SCP Foundation will simply throw their most skilled agents into the fray, in hopes that enough of them will kill or contain an anomalous threat, no matter how many lives it costs. Perhaps nothing exemplifies that more than the body of Private Killian Hess being wheeled away for disposal after falling in battle with SCP-682. As if dying on his first day wasn't bad enough, the superior officers of MTF New 7 are already looking for a replacement to join Hammerdown. If this sounds like fun to you, apply today! Now then, Rucky, go and check out SCP Elite Mobile Task Force Explained and How to Work at the SCP Foundation Explained for more of the ins and outs of working for the SCP Foundation.